Enactment Act No. 14 of 2015, Section 24.1, provides that not later than three months after the end of each financial year, and in accordance with subsection 3, the Board shall submit to the Minister an annual report on the work and activities of the Board for that financial year, and the Minister shall not later than three months after the submission lay the same in Parliament. And Mr. Speaker, a lot has been said and asked for this report, and I'm sure you would share with me the view that the leader of the opposition, who is the main person calling for the report, would have made sure that he's in this honorable house to at least listen to the minister's statement that addresses that report and other matters relating to the CIP. But I'm sure as soon as I'm finished, he will come and join the chamber. But that notwithstanding, Mr. Speaker, what this means is that this report is one year late, for which I sincerely apologize. We should always endeavor at all times to meet our statutory obligations. I do not desire to see this as a routine practice, and I believe that unlike what has become a norm with so many statutory bodies, we should always endeavor to meet our statutory obligations. I have been informed that the delay was due to a number of factors, some of which were beyond the control of the unit. But it is not a time to give reasons or excuses. Better must be done by the unit. I am also informed that every effort is being made by the auditors so that the unit can present to me the annual report for 2023-2024, which is statutorily due to be laid in this house on 31st October 2024. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, we are now at this point only late with one report which has been laid today. I will endeavor, Mr. Speaker, to have this report submitted to Parliament as soon as possible after I have received it. The 2022-2023 report shows, one, 85% increase in applications received from 583 to 1,076. 25% increase in applications granted from 445 to 544. $35.58 million or 94% increase in total assets in comparison to 2022. Growth in shareholders' equity to $37.7 million, or 44% versus prior ending March 2022. Five, 12% growth in revenue from $54.2 million to $60.6 million. Six, 40% increase in staff, bolstering the capacity of the due diligence, verification, and accounts departments. There were, of course, Mr. Speaker, challenges faced by the unit. One, delay in the clearance of funds at the banks affecting processing start times. And two, limited workspace to accommodate the growth in personnel. Three, 43% or $10.1 million increase in program costs, driven by a 948% increase in marketing agent commissions, having resulted in a reduction in surplus from 27.7 million in 2022 to 22.8 million in 2023. Coming off a 44% increase in applications in the previous year, the unit registered another strong performance with an 85% increase in applications compared to the year ending March 2022. This increase in applications was fueled by Galaxy's sale of shares in its canal development and targeted marketing efforts in emerging regions, including parts of the Middle East and West Africa. There was a heavy investment in human capital with the recruitment of skilled personnel in the areas of due diligence, finance, and broader compliance. The year was not without its shortcomings. The unit, which usually processes applications within 90 days, saw an increase in the application processing times. 
Not all factors contributing to this were internal. The due diligence processes were enhanced, resulting in increased waiting for feedback. In addition, our key partners, the banks, NIC, Immigration Department, also had to increase their resource allocation to deal with the increasing demand for their services. The unit continues to be in a strong cash position, boosting an impressive balance sheet with a growth in shareholders' equity by 44% of $37.7 million. The delays in the application time resulted in a delay in the turnover of qualifying investment payments. Despite this, the unit still ended the year with a $22.8 million surplus. I look forward to comments from the public on the report. Beyond the tabling of the report, the CIP has been the subject of much discussion, misinformation, disinformation, political showboating, and maliciousness. Some will even say that the intense focus on the CIP has exposed those whose relentless pursuit of power knows no bounds. So, Mr. Speaker, Today, I will take the opportunity to address a number of concerns, provide information to those who genuinely demand and expect governmental accountability, and expose some of the deceit. I would wish to start with the RICO case filed by Felipe Martinez. In my address on 12 June 2024, I explained the origins of this RICO case as indicated, we did not know Martinez or have any dealings with him. Martinez filed this RICO case against Galaxy and its CEO, two former prime ministers of St. Kitts. The St. Kitts National Bank a St. Kitts escrow agent, and he threw in McLeod Emanuel, the CEO of our CIP, with no basis whatsoever. Martinez has never invested in St. Lucia and has nothing to do with our CIP. He has a grievance with St. Kitts that had nothing to do with St. Lucia, yet he has added McLeod Emanuel to this case. He claims that Mr. Emanuel had knowledge of galaxies underselling in St. Lucia and failed to stop it. All of the defendants are applying to dismiss this RICO case, all of them, and the judge has asked for the motions to be jointly filed on the 1st of November 2024. Since the filing of the civil RICO case in June 2024, a civil case, and not a criminal matter by the US authorities or law enforcement agency, as the opposition is saying, Martinez has called into our local talk shows, attended DBS interviews, and together with Kenneth Rijok and the leader of the opposition, the member for Miku South has launched a vicious attack on me as Minister for the CIP. He has launched an attack on Galaxy, a developer he introduced to St. Lucia and encouraged to invest and undertake a CIP project, and he deemed them an approved developer. He has also launched the attack on upstanding lawyers who are authorized agents because they process applications in relation to the Galaxy project and also attacked employees of the CIP unit for simply doing their jobs and in one case for simply being the daughter of our Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the processes and procedures in place at the unit are the same as when the UWP was in government. The same, except we immediately discontinued the use of the Chinese due diligence firm they were using to review applications for citizenships. Reflect on this. It's the same. Except that they were using a Chinese due diligence firm, which we stopped immediately. It was they who were using the Chinese due diligence firm. When the leader of the opposition attacks me and the CIP program, He's actually attacking a program he maintained for five years and a program which brings significant revenue to our country. The processes undertaken by our CIP unit 
to verify an applicant for citizenship and to ensure the legal requirements for citizenships are met before being issued a certificate of registration are just the same and are maintained and undertaken at the highest level of integrity. Anyone who seeks to state otherwise is only seeking to destroy our CIP and indeed our country. Mr. Speaker, the UWP government introduced Galaxy to St. Lucia and gave them their first allocation of citizenships for the construction of the resort at Carnell's. I spoke, out, I spoke out against Galaxy during my time in opposition. As Galaxy was selling citizenships and there had been no construction or activity, and they had not completed their development in St. Kitts. The member for Miku South at that time stated that he was satisfied with Galaxy and had sent a team to St. Kitts to assess these claims. The lawyer who was representing Galaxy and processing applications for Galaxy was the leader of the opposition, personal lawyer. There were claims, there were claims as far back then that Galaxy was offering financing and discounting sales, the so-called underselling. The honorable member for Miku South stated that these claims were investigated and it was determined that nothing wrong was being done and that there were procedures to ensure that all our requirements were met. The former prime minister gave a resounding endorsement of Galaxy, including assisting them in securing the hotel management contract with AM Resorts. Galaxy also received a strong endorsement from the former Minister of, Com of Commerce. Yes. Here, is, here is the endorsement of the opposition from the member from Suzel Saltibus when in government. And I quote, Caribbean Galaxy Real Estate is a citizenship by investment client. And they were screened through rigorous processes. CIP ensured that the company met all requirements of transparency and had a proven track record of doing ethical business throughout the region and internationally as well. Do you want me to repeat it, Mr. Speaker? Let me repeat it. No. And I quote, Caribbean Galaxy Real Estate is a citizenship by investment client and they were screened through rigorous processes. CIP ensured that the company met all requirements of transparency and had a proven track record of doing ethical business throughout the region and internationally as well. Yet, when it was convenient to join Martinez to destroy our country, our future, our children's future, he changed his tune. This is a poor reflection on our country. How can we encourage developers to invest in St. Lucia and turn around and attack them simply because it is politically expedient to do so? This needs to stop. And the time will come when it will stop. When the leader of the opposition was chastised by right-thinking St. Lucians for his attacks, the member for Miku South stated, and listen to this one, he would bring Martinez, he would visit Martinez and bring back evidence. We are still waiting for the evidence. He has since claimed it would be emailed to him. We are still waiting for the email. Instead, each week, we are promised a bombshell of untold proportions bombshells that will destroy the reputation of our country. Mr. Speaker, spare me to focus on the escrow arrangements. And I really want on all, all honorable members to listen to this one carefully. There is no Ill illegality in the issuance of citizenship applications or in the processes undertaken by the CIP 
in relation to the Galaxy project or any other CIP project. In St. Lucia, since this government came into office in July 2021, when Galaxy became an approved developer, when Galaxy became an approved developer in St. Lucia in 2019, under the former administration, they agreed to construct the Canals project. An escrow agent was approved by the board on 21st August 2019, pursuant to approved guidelines for the establishment and maintenance of an irrevocable escrow account, which includes, among other things, the obligation to hold the proceeds of the said escrow account in trust for Galaxy. In trust for Galaxy. August 2019. In trust for Galaxy and the investor, that is the applicant for citizenship, pursuant to an escrow agreement approved by the board. The guidelines also provided for the escrow account to remit monthly bank statements of the revenue and expenditure of the escrow account to the unit. The escrow account does not hold the money in trust for the government of St. Lucia. It is not our money. It is Galaxy's money from the sale of shares in their development. The money is to be used for the construction of the resort and the developer's expenses. The guidelines expressly state that the escrow agent must hold the money for and on behalf of the developer and the investor and shall release, transfer, or otherwise deal with the escrow funds solely as directed in accordance with the terms of the escrow agreement. The government of St. Lucia is not a party to the escrow agreement, as set up by the leader of the opposition when he was, he was minister. The escrow account, the escrow agreement, is between the developer, the investor, and the escrow agent. These guidelines, practices, and arrangements were all in place since 2019. Under the former administration, we have not changed this. The unit undertakes a rigorous due diligence process in relation to each applicant with reputable due diligence firms from the United States of America and the United Kingdom who review the applications and their back, the applicants and their backgrounds. The due diligence on the applicant is further undertaken by local enforcement, then by the GRCC, which is an additional layer of due diligence shared by all five Caribbean CBI programs. The GRCC is a sub-agency of the Caribbean Community Implementation Agency for Crime and Security, what you know as IMPACTS. No individual, employee, or person of the unit can ever influence the approval granted by these agencies. No one. The statements made by Martinez, Rejok, and the UWP that the Prime Minister's daughter has any influence on this process is completely false. The applicant, also once approved, will pay due diligence fees, will pay due diligence fees, sorry, to the bank account of the unit. The applicant submits the application for citizenship through the authorized agent, which in most cases is a lawyer. The same lawyers, Martinez, the UWP, and Kenneth Rejok have sought to vilify for simply doing their job. The due diligence is undertaken, and once an applicant has been approved by all of these agencies, the escrow agent is asked to provide proof that the minimum investment amount has been paid by the applicant in the escrow account. And the authorized agent is to produce, to provide the oath of allegiance duly signed by the applicant. On receipt of the confirmation that the minimum investment amount has been paid to the escrow account, government fees are received, interviews, interviews carried out, and the oath duly executed. Only then, the applicant is approved for citizenship and the certificate of registration submitted to the minister for execution. So there is a completely process that must be followed by each applicant. This is the same process 
undertaken when the member for Miku South was minister responsible for the CIP. Except the applicants are now required to do interviews, which they were not required to do previously. The only change, we have strengthened the due diligence. We now interview the applicants. The escrow agent remains the same. The guidelines remain the same. And the escrow agreement, the escrow agent has not changed. The guidelines remain the same and the escrow agreement have not changed. The change is that we do more due diligence. The suggestion that illegal passports have been granted because the minimum investment amount was not paid is false, totally false. The suggestion that any passport should be revoked because they were granted illegally is false. We are not privy to the commercial arrangements between an investor, applicant, and a developer. But what we do know is that the applicant pays the minimum investment amount into the escrow account before citizenship is granted to the applicant. And that applicant would have been approved by the due diligence agencies. That's very clear. As I would have explained before, the escrow agent approved by the former administration is to provide monthly statements. That person has not changed. Provide monthly statements to the unit. It is important to note that the unit reviews and reconciles these statements and confirms that the minimum investment amount was in fact paid into the escrow account and the particulars of the transfer is stated. Due diligence fees and government fees are paid by the applicant to the bank account of the unit held at a bank in St. Lucia. The bank in St. Lucia charges fees to undertake its own due diligence in relation to these incoming funds. And these funds are only cleared when the due diligence of the bank is satisfactorily complete. So there's a process in the unit and there's a process in the bank. The allegation that the bank partakes in any money laundering and is complicit in any illegality is false. This attack on our banking system and our citizens is unwarranted and only seeks to destroy the credibility and integrity of our institutions and our people. The member for Miku South knows that the money is the money of the developer. This is the process he approved as Minister for the CIP and approved by the board under his watch. I want to repeat that. This is the process that he approved as Minister for the CIP and approved by the board under his watch. Despite all of this, Mr. Speaker, the member for Miku South contends that he will bring an action to revoke passports and has stated that he will ask Martinez to pay for lawyers to take St. Lucia to court. I quote the former prime minister. Now, and I quote, now I believe that we should write Mr. Martinez and to say to him that if, in fact, the government does not want to join, the people of St. Lucia will join. And so I'm going to ask my party at its next meeting to approve the beginning of a petition in St. Lucia that we accumulate as many names as possible to send it to Mr. Martinez and to tell him that we want our money back, the same money he knows that's not our money and to ask him whether he will pay the legal fees to assist us in going after our money and to make sure our money comes back from China here to St. Lucia. Who made arrangements for our money to go to China in the first place? But, but it is not our money, it's the developer's money. You know. A former prime minister, a member of the House, 
seeking to finance action against his country, knowing full well that he set up a process which provides for Galaxy to retain the investment to construct the resort. He did it. This is a hostile act against the government and people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, I go on. I have heard the false narrative that we have collected over 1.4 billion US dollars and that I have stolen the money. Another version is that Galaxy has collected the monies and I'm benefiting from it. It is a daily story posted and circulated. None of this is true. If they know how to steal $1.4 billion, that's them. We don't engage in theft of public funds or any funds. And no amounting or manufacturing or repeating lies and false narratives can ever make it true. There's been much ado about the number of shares granted to Galaxy by this government. Shares are approved for a CIP project and permits investors who purchase shares from the developer to apply for citizenship. In November 2021, I met with Galaxy and informed them that they are required by law to construct the resort. We insisted that the resort must be built. Galaxy agreed that once they finished selling shares for their project in St. Kitts, they would move their operations to St. Lucia to commence the resort. They later indicated that after consultations with AM Resorts, the scope of the project had increased significantly, and additionally, due to the increased construction costs after 2019, they would need to revise the agreed number of shares. The number of shares to Galaxy was increased by the board, and construction on the resort began in early 2023. We have noted delays in construction, and it has not been at the pace and stage that we require. And I've met with Galaxy to discuss Member the delays. Of South, just hold on. Member for Miku North, Miku South, there is a process in requesting information from members. I would suggest you read the standing orders, acquaint yourself with that process, and not cross-talk the member by asking questions which the standing orders allow you to ask. We, we have... I come into that. I come into that. We have been assured, because you will tell me what you did in the DSH shares. We have been assured that construction will be accelerated and the result will be completed by May 2026. Delays and costs increases in construction has affected almost every project in St. Lucia since COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, if it is that Galaxy was conducting its business illegally and wrongfully allowed to earn over $1 billion that belongs to St. Lucia, then the former government, the former prime minister, would need to answer a few questions. DSH applied for CIP approval for a project estimated at US $1.8 billion. In their proposal, they requested 9,160 shares. 9,160 shares. Now multiply this by US 300,000 K. That gives $2.7 billion. I am told that the then CEO of the CIP was removed from office because she did not recommend approval of the application. The requirement to allow CIP escrow accounts to be held in St. Lucia was changed by the former administration to accommodate DSH. So it was he that changed the law to allow escrows to be held overseas. But listen to this, Mr. Speaker. There was placed on the CIP website, and it is still there, the announcement and placement of the Alpina St. Lucia Hotel and Alpina Square as two CIP-approved projects. You can visit the website now. Scroll to the bottom and click on Get an Investment Project Approved. You can even see the date that it was announced to the world on the website, January 11, 2021. January 11, 2021. Now, does that mean that the $2.7 billion is missing? Does that mean that the former Prime Minister for the CIP is corrupt and stole the money? 
Mr. Speaker asked the Leader of the Opposition about the range development. About the range development. This was approved. This was approved as a CIP real estate development. But was then actually sold as a donation option under the former administration. There is no authority. There is no authority on which real estate shares could be sold as donation. And I want to repeat this. I want to repeat this. Range was approved as a CIP real estate option. But it was sold as a donation option under the former administration. There is no authority, no changes in the regulations, no changes in the law that allows real estate to be sold as donation. Under which authority was it done? How many shares were sold? Where was the money deposited? How much money was paid to range in settlement of the claim against the government? Who else were payments made to? Maybe the leader of the opposition can answer these questions. So before he can demand answers to questions, maybe he should start answering a few about Alpina and range. Mr. Speaker, I cannot move on without reflecting on the untold damage that has been done to the reputation of a group of lawyers and employees of the CIP unit and the board members by the actions of Martinez, Kenneth Rejok, and the UWP party. You see, when it was thought that Thaddeus Antoine was a beneficiary of the operations of Galaxy, he was accused and maligned as corrupt and as an enabler. All sorts of stories were made up. But then reality strikes. There were several lawyers who are authorized agents doing their job and processing applications for a CIP project approved by the former administration. They now attack and vilify Jeffrey Dubule, who he knows very well, Diana Thomas, Jonathan McNamara, and Brenda Fosak. Articles have been written and statements made about them which are completely and totally unwarranted and unacceptable. There was no wrong committed by these lawyers, and it is unfair for them to be targeted and wrongfully accused. Accomplished professionals having to pay the price of cheap, vindictive politics by the leader of the opposition. They have also attacked and threatened the jobs of employees and threatened members of the board. All of this is unwarranted and needs to stop. In my address of June 12, 2024, I provided details of the number of applications received and approvals given and indicated how many were real estate approvals for Galaxy? Mr. Speaker, I wish to provide an update on these figures. From 1st of August 2021 to 30th August 2024, we have granted 2,873 approvals, of which 1,970, or 69%, were real estate for Galaxy. Let me repeat it, Mr. Speaker, because people will say uh, I mean, that 14,000 applications have been given and multiplied. From 1st of August, 2021, a few days after we came into office, to 30th August, 2024, we have granted 2,873 approvals. 2,800 and 73 approvals, of which 1,970, or 69 percent, were real estate for Galaxy. So Galaxy has only received 1,970 approvals since we came into office. Contrary to what you have heard in publicized interviews and repeated by the member for Miku South and the UWP, St. Lucia has never approved 14,000 applications. I want to repeat. St. Lucia has never approved 14,000 applications, and there is no $1.4 billion. We have only approved over 1,970 real estate applications for Galaxy. I must also categorically state that contrary to what has been said, Galaxy has never 
collected $1.2 billion. Mr. Speaker, I now address the infrastructure option. I have never seen an opposition so scared and panic so quickly at the announcement of a government program. Why are they so scared of the apparent success of the CIP and particularly the infrastructure option? The opposition has been raising issues with the so-called infrastructure option and what they claim is corruption. Not that they disagree with an infrastructure option and that they have a brighter idea. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, not that the United Workers Party and the leader of the opposition disagree with an infrastructure option and that they have a brighter idea. Instead, it is just seen as corruption. Under the enterprise option, we added a third sub-option which allows a developer to propose a self-financed project in one of the investment areas in exchange for an agreed number of qualifying applications, similar to shares in the real estate option. The developer has to source the finance and spend upfront and carries all the risk, has the responsibility for sourcing the applicants, carries the risk of sale and even termination of the program and has to implement the project under the supervision of the government of St. Lucia. Since its announcement, we have been able to secure investment in a national infrastructure improvement project by Caribbean Galaxy, a housing project by BMAX LLC, which I will come to shortly. And we have a pending application for another housing project. The opposition has cried foul. They claim that the option is illegal. They claim it is illegal because it was not gazetted. The changes to provide for this option were gazetted on December 20th, 2023. So how was it not gazetted? How? As per legislation, the opposition could have tabled a resolution in Parliament to oppose the changes. They never did. It meant that it is now legal to offer the option to investors. We were delayed in gazetting the specific projects as approved projects. We believe that this has to be done to inform the public of the projects that have been approved. Once we were aware of the failing, we immediately corrected it. But if not gazetting the specific projects is legal, is illegal, then what of the projects the leader of the opposition did not gazette? It has been brought to our attention that the DSH projects, the range development, and the Galaxy Canals projects were never gazetted. Were never gazetted by the former administration. The same persons who are saying we are illegal because we had not gazetted on time. They never gazetted it. But yet, all those projects won the CIP website as approved, what not. We are now presently awaiting guidance from legal counsel as to whether we should proceed to gazette the Canals project. So we may very well now, years later, go and rectify it because they are saying it must be done, but they never did it for no project. So we may still have to gazette the Canals project for you. You see, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this enterprise option has the potential to open significant avenues for investment in constructing roads and highways, upgrading educational institutions, housing, and medical facilities. And I want, Mr. Speaker, for you to listen to this one. No applications have yet been approved under these projects and they are still going through the due diligence processes. 
no applications under the infrastructure option has been approved. And they are all still going through the due diligence process. Further, no minimum investment amounts have been received by these developers. No minimum investment amounts have been received by these developers. The BMAX housing project commenced in October 2024. And the Galaxy project has not yet commenced as the Ministry of Infrastructure is in the process of identifying various works and contractors for these projects. Mr. Speaker, BMAX LLC, whom I mentioned earlier, has recently become the subject of discussion in the media. And I think it is important that I explain the position. In 2022, after a roadshow promoting the Citizenship by Investment Program, we received through one of our marketing agents a prospective investor, BMAX LLC, a company incorporated in the United Arab Emirates, represented by Alexandra Mijalovic, who was interested in financing housing and road infrastructure projects. Having been provided with the list of possible areas of investment in, in roads and housing, BMAX submitted a letter of intent dated 22nd November 2022 for the Rock Hall housing development. BMAX visited St. Lucia in December 2022. All background checks and due diligence were undertaken and provided no adverse findings. The project was approved in January 2024, and the developer started the sale of shares to investors in February 2024. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, September 30th, 2024, I was informed that Mr. Alexander Mijadovic had been arrested on February 19th, 2024, for alleged involvement in smuggling of cigarettes between 2016 and 2021. This was long after all our background checks and due diligence was done. He was not charged, but put on bail pending further investigations. The CIP unit has a system for continuous monitoring of all St. Lucian's CIP citizens, but Alexander Mijalovic is not a citizen and would not have shown up on any notification. Immediately upon receiving such information, the unit sought to obtain as much information as possible, as much information as possible, to understand what had transpired, in including asking the individual involved to submit a signed statement, duly notarized, explaining the circumstances of his arrest and questioning. A statement was received by the unit. The following was explained, that he is innocent. Two, that he is a victim of political persecution. He stated that he owns business interests in Montenegro, including media interests. He is well known as a supporter and donor of the now opposition party, which lost parliamentary elections in June 2023. He indicated that once he was arrested, he transferred all his shares in his various businesses to other investors. Therefore, he holds no longer, therefore, he no longer holds any interest in the company undertaking the housing project. He stated, number four, that according to Montenegro law, not leader of the opposition law, according to Montenegro law, the prosecution has six months to indict and charge him. The six months expired on August 19, 2024. The persecution requested an extension of two months to complete the investigations. The two months expired on October 19, 2024. He has not been charged. We are presently awaiting further information from various sources on the situation and will take legal advice on the options open to the government of St. Lucia on how we proceed in relation to this developer and this project. Meanwhile, we are conducting due diligence on the new owner of BMAX, Veslin Kovacevic. I will provide updates as they become available. But let me assure St. Lucians and the constituents of Kasris is of one thing. Whether it is with BMAX or no BMAX, the Rock Hall housing development will be built. The people of Castries East 
and all St. Lucians deserve better housing. Mr. Speaker, we believe that it is important that you know how the monies earned from the CIP have been used. I cannot explain how monies were used under the previous government, as we do not know how monies were used. No one in here can remember a single project that was ever funded by the CIP under the previous administration. Not one. I will leave it to the leader of the opposition to provide such information to the Honorable House how he spent the CIP millions that he had. Since July 2021, a total of $146.8 million have been transferred to the National Economic Fund. Let me repeat it, Mr. Speaker. And I want the Leader of the Opposition to make his notes that he has a way of accusing and saying things. $146.8 million has been transferred to the National Economic Fund. Of that amount, $75 million has been transferred to the Consolidated Fund and used primarily for debt repayments. From excess operating cash earned by the unit, $54.1 million has been spent supporting the work of various agencies and programs. I shall categorize and highlight as follows. Agricultural support, $2.2 million. Included is the construction of the Miku jetty and support for banana farmers affected by the delay in supply of packaging material. Number two, national security and citizen safety. $2.8 million included is support for RSS officers, vehicles for the police, and for supplying the bodily correctional facilities with equipment. Number three, constituency development. $3.4 million used for supporting the constituency development program in housing and small projects. Four, culture and creative support, 4.2 million used for carnival and festival expenses. Five, educational support, $5 million, notably for back to school support and other school support. Six, energy support, 1.2 million used to subsidize the price of fuel and LNG. Seven, for food subsidy, $4.3 million used to subsidize food prices and provide food vouchers. Eight, health services, $13.3 million to meet liabilities of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex and outstanding COVID-19 bills. Nine, national infrastructural improvement, $3.8 million used to improve the national road network. Ten, national emergency response, $800,000 for flood relief victims. Eleven, Social development projects, 8.4 million used for various social development programs, projects, and other small infrastructural projects. 12, sports, 1.5 million. 13, community tourism, 1.6 million used for additional works at the Ancillary Waterfront Project. Mr. Speaker, I hope the above provides a fairly comprehensive account of monies that has been spent by the government from monies earned from the CIP since July 2021. I have not accounted for the expenditure of the National Economic Fund as it has been audited, nor monies held in trust at the National Economic Fund and CIP unit awaiting transfer. Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude by again reflecting on the extraordinary vicious attack on the CIP and the citizens of St. Lucia. It is not a critic of policy, decision-making, or operations. It has been personal, malicious, untrue, unpatriotic, and destabilizing. It has known no bonds. But what is interesting is that this attack has been fed from information from Martinez and Rejok. Martinez has said a lot and promised a lot and soon the courts will decide. It was clear that Martinez wanted to destroy the CIP for his own purposes. He found a willing ally in a member for Miku South, who shows no loyalty to St. Lucia or St. Lucians. I am confident that the RICO case will be exposed as a sham 
and all accomplices will have to account. Mr. Speaker, the UWPs have taken comfort in the writings of Kenneth Rejock, who describes himself as a convicted money launderer. But it's important that you remember the writings of Rejock in relation to the member for Miku South. What Rejock wrote about the member for Miku South. Writings that have since de been deleted from his online blog. Luckily, they can still be found. Let me take you back to one of his articles about the leader of the opposition, dated March 21st, 2021, titled, St. Lucia's Prime Minister's Criminal Conduct Justifies His Removal and Arrest. That was the title of the article. St. Lucia's Prime Minister, it was March 2021. St. Lucia's Prime Minister... Just one second. Technology is failing me there. Criminal misconduct justifies his removal and arrest and he was to, to the then former Prime Minister. Rejok describes and stated that the then Prime Minister, now opposition member for Miku South, and I quote, and I want you to listen carefully, Alan Shasi's administration operates on a plan similar of a former administration in the United States where every cabinet official is for sale if the price is right. Rejok went on to say, and I quote, Alan Chastney is comparable to the con man and pathological liar type and bluster. And that, and I quote again, after years that Chastney has remained in office, crime and corruption are still the order of the day. That's what Kenneth Rejok wrote about him. Maybe, maybe the leader of the opposition should offer an explanation for the statement made, the statements made in that article. If he can justify his actions and level accusations on the basis of what Rejok writes, then how comes how does he account for what Rejok said about him? Because he's quoting Rejok, he's quoting Martinez, but this is what Rejok said about him. How does he explain it? Mr. Speaker, I end by giving the assurance to the people of St. Lucia that our CIP is in safe hands. Since the signing of the memorandum of agreement between the countries in the region offering CIP, a regional regulatory body has been established. We welcome this as it will make all the programs more transparent and accountable. We have also engaged an auditor, Deloitte, to undertake an audit of the CIP, which will review our operations and make recommendations where necessary. The new pricing structure introduced by the MOA has affected the structure of investments. We are presently in discussions with Galaxy, potential investors, and our legal counsel to ensure that the most robust and compliant structure for these investments. Mr. Speaker, I can inform the Honorable House that since July 1st, all infrastructure sales as well as potential new investments for real estate and infrastructure have been suspended. Since July 1st, have been suspended. We are hoping that very shortly we will resume sales and all our normal activities. We will be stronger and better. The CIP is a major source of revenue and offers the possibility to finance our national development in a significant way. It is why the UWPs are relentless to destroy it. They see their doom in its success. They have created a false narrative about corruption and scandal. They have joined with two ex-cons who attacked the program, the Prime Minister and myself, and even persons who are not political. But it is not about myself or the Prime Minister. It is about our country, our people, our development, our dreams and our aspirations. No one who wants to lead this country should do so on a foundation of manufactured lies and deceit. 
we will overcome Martinez, Rejoc, and when the time comes, you, the people of St. Lucia, will answer the leader of the opposition in a louder voice than you did on July 26, 2021. I thank you. Are there any minist other ministerial statements? Papers to be laid, Prime Minister, Minister for Finance. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 126 of 2024, money laundering prevention amendment regulations. Statutory instrument number 127 of 2024, fiscal incentives, island property development limited order. Statutory number 128 of 2024, Public Finance Management Act, resolution of Parliament to authorize the Minister of Finance to guarantee borrowing by the St. Lucia Development Bank for the housing sector and productive sectors in St. Lucia. Statutory number 129 of 2024, Public Finance Management Act, resolution of Parliament to borrow for capital and current expenditure to finance emergency cleanup and restoration of critical infrastructural projects. Hatimi Instrument number 143 of 24, Fiscal Incentives, Garnish Machine Shop Limited Order. You missed 131? Uh, you said Study Instrument number 141 of 2024, Fiscal Incentives, Garnish Machine Shop Limited Order. Study Instrument number 143 of 2024, Excise Tax Amendment Schedule number 1, number 14 order. Siding instrument number 145 of 2024, tourist duty-free shopping system, Cabot St. Lucia Incorporated order. Siding instrument number 148 of 2024, aiding land holding licensing exemption, SDL Limited, SDSL Enterprises Limited, and SDSL Ventures Limited order. Siding instrument number 149 of 2024, legal professional eligibility, Kaya Re Tawan order. That is instrument number 140 of 2024, tourist duty free shopping system, GMC Holdings Incorporated order. That is instrument number 140 of 2024, excise tax amendment schedule one, number 15 order. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Tourism. Speaker, I wish to lay the following papers standing in my name. Saturday instrument number 130 of 2024, Tourism Stimulus Investment, Rodney Bay City Centre Limited Order, Citizen by, Citizenship by Investment Annual Report 2022-2023, and on behalf of the Minister for External Affairs, International Trade, Civil Aviation and Diaspora Affairs, Statutory Instrument Number 136 of 2024, Civil Aviation Flight Safety Regulations, and on behalf of the Minister for the Public Service, Labour and Gender Affairs, Statutory Instrument Number 134 of 2024, Labor minimum wage order. Minister for Commerce. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to lay the following papers appearing on my name. Statutory instrument number 132 of 2024, price control amendment number 14 order. Statutory instrument number 141 of 2024, price control amendments number 15 order. Somebody holding papers for the minister in the, in the office of the prime minister. Oh, my apologies, member. I was thinking of the other minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I beg two lady following papers stand in my name. Statutory instrument 137 of 2024, Citizenship of St. Lucia Amendment Regulations. Motions, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Resolutions, whereas on the section 10 1091, on the section 1091E, 
of the value added tax act cap 15.42 the act it is provided that the minister of finance may by order published in the gazette amend the schedules to the acts and whereas it is further provided on the section 1092 of the act that an order made pursuant to section 1091 of the act is subject to an affirmative resolution of parliament except where the amendment is to the customs tariffs heading. And whereas, the Minister of Finance seeks approval of the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, number 4 order, to amend Schedule 3 of the Act by an affirmative resolution of Parliament to include as an exempt import or local supply the import of local supply of goods and services by the St. Lucia National Trust. Be it resolved that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, number 4 order, which amends Schedule 3 of the Act to include as an exempt import or local supply the import of local supply of goods and services by the St. Lucia National Trust. Mr. Speaker, this is an amendment to the value, for the Value Added Tax Act that exempts the Solution National Trust from the payment of VAT. Mr. Speaker, I would not like to go into the history of how the National Trust has been treated. And we want the National Trust to be able to operate in an environment free of fear and free from fear, but they also want the National Trust to be cognizant of the situation in the country. So we need them to have dialogue with the government, have dialogue with stakeholders, so that we can come to a gentle balance, a balance that is normally in, in a win-win situation. The National Trust asks to assist in the cash flow by making them VAT exempt. And we agreed, Mr. Speaker, because we really want to cause the National Trust to be able to operate, to be able to do the, the conservation and what they need to do to protect St. Lucia's patrimony, Mr. Speaker, to protect for the next generation the assets of St. Lucia. But the National Trust themselves must understand that they have a responsibility to work with the people of St. Lucia, to work with the various stakeholders so we can strike a balance, Mr. Speaker. I mean, Mr. Speaker, I just want to give you an example of how this government does its business different from the other, from the other government, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you may have seen the demolition of the old courthouse building and the old ed education building, Mr. Speaker. And I saw, as usual, somebody jumping in his and saying, oh, they didn't consult the National Trust. Mr. Speaker, I have on record, because you know, Mr. Speaker, the way this government, the way we operate, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we have the results that, that we have, is we remain focused. We remain focused. We keep our eye on the prize. And we knew that we will not end up in the same situation when the custody suite was demolished, the old prison was demolished. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you about the old prison. When people make you understand that we are just being intolerant or we are just pretending when you speak about old prisons. Mr. Speaker, I was in Mexico last month. And let me just speak a part of the presidential palace. is an old prison. And you know, so, Mr. Speaker, we, in this country, we deliberately attempt to mislead people for our own personal benefits. I had to talk to them, old building, old St. Jude, old building, old. Mr. Speaker, all buildings are archaeological assets and treasures, Mr. Speaker. They are kept. 
They are repaired. They are renovated. But in St. Lucia, old building, they live all St. Jude. Old. Mr. Speaker, when we decided to demolish the courthouse building, we wrote the National Trust. We asked them to come to inspect the building, to ask if there was anything of any value that we should have kept or restored. They visited the courthouse. They said that there were some things, pictures that had to be kept. We agreed. We put that in storage. The old educational building, there was a structural assessment that that building was not fit. It had no, the structural integrity was compromised. And there was nothing there of any significant value for the National Trust. So they, they said we could destroy it. But I heard, oh, they, did, they went on us to talk about National Trust for the, for the custody suites, but they didn't do it for these two buildings. Because that is the level of misinformation that spread all, and people say it convincingly, and they jump and accuse, and accuse other people. Never remembering what they say. I want to inform you, Mr. Speaker, that any development that's going on in St. Lucia, we have spoken to the National Trust, we've got their opinion, and we proceed. Same thing in the Hotel uh, development at Mont Mon Pima. We spoke to the National Trust. But I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, people who, who are involved in that kind of activity, they normally have disagreements because it, it, it's a normal all over the world. In fact, there's a whole party called Greenpeace that even wins seats in, in elections because of their position on, 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 on the environment, etc. So there will be disagreement sometimes. There will be things we will not agree on. There must be. You can have a society where everybody agrees on everything, but when you disagree, you disagree with truth. Not disagree with maliciousness and lies. So we are working with, with the National Trust. We restored the subvention. We restored the subvention because we not believe that because somebody disagrees with you, you must, you must victimize them. You must make them pay. You must make them suffer because they disagree with you. You must threaten them because they disagree with you. You must call them names because they disagree with you. We paid the National Trust as a pension, and we continue to pay it, Mr. Speaker. So this, this removal of VAT for National Trust is just another, another step. As we begin negotiations with the National Trust, for the use of prison point for jazz. We need to have, we need to have with the National Trust mature discussions on the use of prison point for jazz. These discussions must be mature, they must be give and take, because the jazz festival, Mr. Zusha, this year, Mr. Speaker, this year, is projected to be one of the biggest ever in the history of St. Lucia. In fact, jazz and carnival are becoming larger and larger, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm glad we speak about festivals, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know now, you know now, you know now, Mr. Speaker, in October, there are some hotels that are 100% occupancy in October, in October, Mr. Speaker, there are some hotels, 100% occ occupancy, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, but you know, but you know, Mr. Speaker, I, the only thing, Mr. Speaker, is figures do not lie. Men lie, some men lie, Mr. Speaker, but figures do not lie. Figures do not lie, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, when they have their own in their own narrative, they give their own stories, Mr. Speaker. Anytime you challenge them on the facts, they go around. Maybe that's something we, we understand. You challenge them on the facts, they move away. 
Exactly. You say something that's factual, they say something else. Yeah. They never did it the facts. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank gives figures on the economy. You attack the, 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 the governor. Financial statements are prepared. You attack the auditor. It's really, it's something that's so strange, Mr. Speaker. The, I mean, the central bank, let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, the governor of the central bank, any minister of finance who knows anything about being a minister of finance would know that the governor of the central bank sometimes, and sometimes we even believe he's the minister of finance for the region. The governor of the central bank, Mr. Speaker, is not appointed by any prime minister. The governor of the central bank is appointed by the monetary council. Mr. Speaker, when an opposition can, men, can support its members attacking the governor of the central bank, we are in a lot of trouble. What we are reaping, Mr. Speaker, we are going to sow. We are going to sow these things. What are you reaping? You, you, you supported attacking the governor of the central bank? Not attacking him on his performance, you know, but, but attacking him on a report that he presented. Mr. Speaker, I, I hope that the National Trust will use this wisely. They will use that the National Trust will use the waiver of VAT wisely so that they can continue their work for the people of Saint Mr. Speaker. I thank you. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment to Schedule 3, Number 4 order which amends Schedule 3 of the Act to include as an exempt import or local supply the import or local supply of goods and services by the St. Lucia National Trust. Member from Miku South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> over the last couple of weeks I've heard some new titles bestowed on the Prime Minister and I have to say after hearing that presentation by the Prime Minister Mr. Speaker I have to concur with every single one of them. The Prime Minister, the member from Castries East Mr. Speaker, cannot even present a proper justification for something as simple as waiving that on the operations of National Trust without attempting to politicize it? That's okay. I think me and the rest of St. Lucia have really become very accustomed to these kind of presentations in the House. So given that this level of latitude was given to the member, I'm hoping that the Speaker will find it in his own heart to allow me to respond to some of the issues that were brought up. First of all, National Trust is a statutory agency, and as I have said in the past, Mr. Speaker, it is an agency that in many ways is conflicted because it has a board of persons that believe in conservation. But at the same time, it is an entity that over time has been vested lands by the government and the people of Solution. And many people have believed that a lot of that has been to preserve from an environmental perspective those lands. But at the same time, some of those lands, and the Prime Minister made reference to the, he didn't really finish the story, but I, I've I have no idea what he's talking about, but um, reference to the president of, of Mexico's house and some prison, I, I mean, I think what he means to say is that you can have a, 
historical site that can also be commercial or have a, a multiple functions at the same time. <coughs> Further evidence of the problem that the National Trust is facing, Mr. Speaker, is exactly why I believe the Prime Minister has come to the House to seek our support to allow the National Trust to operate VAT free. So instead of having to pay VAT like all of the commercial entities, they're going to do so. And I genuinely believe, Mr. Speaker, that if in fact that the only and sole reason why National Trust existed was to be a conservationist and a protector, and they were not going to be involved in any level of commercial activity, then I think I would have zero difficulties with it. But we start crossing a line because the, the member from Cassarizis brings up I, I, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we're going to start discussing jazz festival. So are we meant to believe that part of the negotiations that's taking place here with the National Trust is a quid pro quo? That the government is now going to let them have VAT free and in somehow there's going to be some better relationship between the National Trust and um, the government as it pertains to jazz? Right? So, Mr. Speaker, I love that to know, Mr. Speaker. The member from Denry speaking about the victimization. That's the narrative that the Labour Party has wanted to peddle forever. That's what, but you see, Mr. Speaker, it is now catching up with them. It is now catching up with them. The fact is, is that there has to be negotiation with the National Trust and the subvention that had always been given to the National Trust, which started off at 200,000, by the time I got into office was 700,000. And instead of that subvention being used for capital expender projects, that subvention was being used to pay salaries. You're talking about an entity that is a commercial entity that is making money off of Pigeon Island and making money off of its other entities. And the question is, the conflict that exists within the trust itself as to why they cannot be one thing or the other. So, is there a possibility of developing Pigeon Island? Member from Microsoft, you've asked me for latitude. But what you're doing there is asking me to abandon the standing orders altogether. This is a debate. The member for Castro is East made certain points. The latitude you request is to respond to those points, not to give the historicity of the National Trust. So the member didn't make comments about restoration of the subvention. You can deal with that. But you are asking me to abandon the standing orders altogether and not give you latitude. So I am prepared to give you the latitude, but you've gone so far away from aligning yourself with either the comments made or the resolution before us that I can't permit it. So yes, you have your latitude because the member did make some points <coughs> out with of the resolution, but you, you've made a quantum leap yourself. So please proceed, but within the guidelines. So Mr. Speaker, I think that you and I are going to be in trouble because I have not even begun to take my latitude because my conversation has been at this point well, restricted. I can only tell you, in this house, there is only one speaker. So the, you, you will not be in problems with me. You won't be in problems with me. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if your English is different than my English, but right now, I have been keeping and restricting my conversation about the National Trust, if I'm not mistaken. And please guide me, Mr. Speaker. Are we not discussing the uh, application for there to be a waiver of the um, uh, value-added tax for National Trust? Is that not what we're debating? I have given you my guidelines. Mr. Speaker, so I'm, I need your guidelines because here it is. I have not even began to express my latitude because we have to go to the, uh, the, the governor of the central bank. I've not gotten there yet. I'm still only dealing right now with the National Trust and the, and the request by the member from Castries East that we approve in this house the waiver of the VAT 
for national trust. That's what I've been talking about. I'm not talking about anything else. And I'm saying that national trust has two relationships. One, it's a conservationist, and at the same time, it is managing properties. It's commercial. Is there not an expectation, some expectation, Mr. Speaker, that as the government and as taxpayers of this country, that's who we represent. We represent the taxpayers. Is it not fair to ask, what has the National Trust been doing in order to reduce the burden of the taxpayers, especially when the state and the people of this country have bestowed and given them that much land? What are they doing with it? Okay, so what are we doing to use Pigeon Island to generate more resources on a regular basis? I remember when I was Prime Minister and I asked the National Trust that same question, Mr. Speaker, which comes to the issue that the Prime Minister raised to say that somehow that we, uh, I can't even remember the word that he used, um, that we, we penalized, penalized the, uh, the, the National Trust because we took away their subvention. We took away the, we didn't take away the subvention, we withheld the subvention on the basis that they would be providing a business plan for, may I be protected? We, we withheld the subvention. We withheld the subvention, Mr. Speaker, on the basis that the National Trust was supposed to present a plan on how they were going to run their affairs, how they were going to support themselves. Because as I said, the subvention was being given for capital investment for them to be at some point self-sufficient. The plan that was presented, Mr. Speaker, to me when I was Prime Minister, and, and the, the member from Casuizis would know that's normally the Prime Minister that the Trust responds to, was that they wanted to build and convert the museum that they had into a conference facility. Well, it's not me, Mr. Speaker. It's not me who built. They came up with the idea and a store at the front. They had, they had a feasibility that was done when they eventually provided the feasibility study to us, Mr. Speaker, the feasibility gave them the answer that that was not going to work. And remember, that is long before the Royalton Hotel was built and before Harbor Club was built. And the study showed them that, that there was nothing unique about making that a conference facility. So again, we had multiple discussions with them. And one of them, Mr. Speaker, was if we're doing a jazz festival, and we showed that over a 20-year period, Mr. Speaker, that the, not the tourist board had spent in excess of $25 million over 20 years in putting up stages and breaking down stages and preparing Pigeon Island for the event. Imagine if that money was invested in putting a permanent stage up at Pigeon Island and making it now a world-class amphitheater and that in addition to being able to host the jazz festival and any of the other festivals that the government likes is that we now would have introduced for the first time mr speaker a permanent stage for the arts that we could have had now a dance show we could have had a theatrical show a musical show that would have been also for dinner because you know we have a problem mr speaker we keep complaining about the number of all-inclusive hotels that we have and the way in order to get the people out of the all-inclusive hotels is to generate a revenue opportunity for everyone, Mr. Speaker. Okay? Oh, no, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to love, I'm going to, I, I'm going to really enjoy myself today with the kind of heckling that I'm, I'm hearing this today. So they're saying to me, Mr. Speaker, I was there for six years, we did not get it done. But yet, this is the same group of people that said that we acted as autocrats and were forcing the trust to do what we didn't want to do. That's not true. That's for the trust to make a determination. All the government can say is, come up with an idea that is going to allow the National Trust to be commercially self-sustaining. You have assets, whether it's Maria Island, whether it's Fondor, whether it's a whole bunch of other sites that they have, what are you doing to apply them to make them more viable? It cannot be them to just sit there and look pretty. And then, you know, Mr. Speaker, the whole issue of the Dolphin Park came in, and, the, you know, the members on the opposite side talk about um, misleading people. 
their own people were going out and saying that we wanted to build a sea aquarium on Pigeon Island. Nothing further from the truth. Absolutely nothing. In fact, what was, was being done was a dolphin pen in the ocean. And what would have done? It meant you had a half day tour with the dolphin park and you would have had a half day tour with Pigeon Island. So Mr. Speaker, so if you take between putting up a permanent stage that can do evening shows 52 weeks of the year and also to be able to host all of our different events and generate money, the simple calculation was is that the National Trust could have made a profit of almost $7 million just on the theater show. Far less, another $2 million that they could have made easily off of the Dolphin Park. So Mr. Speaker, well, we can sit down, we can go through the numbers, not a problem. But again, Mr. Speaker, this is a government that we don't have to guess anymore. When they were in opposition, they were beating pans. They had no plans. And after being three years in government, and still with the pressure that you have, there's still no plans, Mr. Speaker. Here is it you want to call National Trust. You want to go and give them a waiver? No problem. But what's the plan? It cannot be that it's just about lay, laying up and giving you an easier time with, uh, not with uh, the Jazz Festival. Where's the investment in, in Pigeon Island that's going to make it world class? And that's what distinguishes St. Lucia. And its event has always been Pigeon Island. Pigeon Island is the thing that changes us. And nobody else could have. If you now have, if you now have Mr. Speaker, cruise ships, and you can encourage cruise ships to stay in port later at night because we have an activity that we can sell them, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> So this is the difficulty, and I'm glad to hear the Prime Minister is what, somewhat agreeing with that, is that there has to be a discussion with the National Trust and a fairness. How are they going to add value to the development of our country? And it can't just be about conservation at the cost of the taxpayers. Therefore, why give them the assets? And that's the problem, is you have a situation where you have a board that is conservation-minded, and I have no difficulties with that, but then you have a management team that does not know how to be able to, to balance that. And I can see that the government is having the same difficulties. So there was never here of anybody wanting to um, penalize the National Trust. It was holding the National Trust accountable to the taxpayer's money. And I believe every St. Lucian would respect that. Every single. But instead, we have a government that just wants to give away the money and not be accountable for the money. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the member from Castries East, Mr. Speaker, brought up about making derogatory remarks about the Governor General. Governor of Central Bank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Making derogatory remarks. And I've personally spoken to the Governor. And I said to him, you came on a TV show and you said that the 2.5% levy for security and health was going to a good cause. We have found out in this house, Mr. Speaker, that the money is not going to security and it's not going to health. And I asked him, I said, when you are going to come here to make a presentation, you ought to have at least done your own research or have your team do the research. Because one week before you came, there was a letter from the Medical and Dental Association that described the situation with health in this country as the worst that it's ever been and gave a horrific description of what's going on. In fact, the letter, Mr. Speaker, forewarned, forewarned that if in fact the situation was not resolved, there would be, there would be further resignations. And they were. So I asked the governor, how is it you can go, come to St. Lucia, and make comments like that? Okay? And that is completely contrary to the, what the facts are on the ground. That's the question. So, Mr. Speaker, how can the, gov how can the governor come here and, and make those kind of statements? That's egregious. It's unacceptable. So you cannot come and make allegations or suggestions to the general public that the money is going to a cause in which we all know and the public knows it's not happening. 
We have a crisis right now, Mr. Speaker, taking place in Castries, the Castries Basin. None of the healthcare centers are working. None. But I'm going to, I'm going to show you, Mr. Speaker, how unimaginative that this government is. And that lack of imagination comes from the fact that they have no sense of urgency as to what people are feeling on the ground. So you're talking about Castries East, the Prime Minister, Castries North, the, was it the Senior Minister, Castries South, the Deputy Prime Minister, and Castries Central, the want-to-be Prime Minister, four of the most senior people in your cabinet. All of them, no healthcare centers working in the Castries Basin. And instead of the member from Castries Central on his show dealing with the crisis it had, instead he's there trying to, to find 99,000 reasons why the, 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 the PS building or home is okay. But that's all right. But meanwhile, Mr. Speaker, while I was in. Member for Castries Central. Mr. 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 Speaker, I am a politician and I expect jazz, but it's just on a point of order making inferences to someone who's not present in the house in a derogatory manner. He referred to my PS and talk about 99,000 reasons. This is the very prime minister, Mr. Speaker. Well, what, what's, the, what's, the point of, what's the point of order? The member? point of order is he, he, he makes reference to my permanent secretary who is not involved in politics, who is not in the house, and who cannot defend herself from his remarks in this chamber. But what, what is it that he said that requires a defense? He referenced my PS. No, all he said was rather than deal with something pertinent to the nation's business, you instead spend the time on your show defending your PS. That's all he said. In building her house. But that's what you said. Mr. Speaker, he referred to in building her house. Well, he never suggested the building was improper. He was simply saying that's what you spend your time on as opposed defending to... Defending building a house? I didn't say defending. He didn't say that. What did you say? All he simply said was you, you, you spent, you look for 99,000 reasons defending something and then rather than dealing with the nation's business, you were defending the building of your house by your peers. I didn't say the building. There is Mr. nothing derogatory about it. M M Mr. Speaker, if that is your ruling, I have to abide by your finding. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping the same degree of latitude afforded to the honorable member would be afforded to your humble servant. You, you will be afforded latitude, but certainly there is nothing affording him latitude on that statement. Yes, but Mr. Speaker, we are dealing with VAT exemption for the um, National Trust and my PS's house found its way into that argument. So I'm saying in a very crafty way, other things can come into the argument, Mr. Speaker. Fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The point I was trying to make, Mr. Speaker, of the lack of imagination and the lack of any urgency by this government, which is certainly displayed in the presentation of this, of this, of this motion, while I was Prime Minister, one of the things I had negotiated, Mr. Speaker, with the U.S. government was to get a mobile um, hospital. In fact, after the elections, the uh, then ambassador came over and I remember the presentation um, of that said hospital, which I assume is in storage. Now, you would have thought that the four senior people, the Prime Minister, the Senior Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the want-to-be Prime Minister, in Cabinet, understanding there's no health care facilities available to the people in, in the Cassidy's Basin. And the only place they can go to now is OKEU, which is in chaos. Why don't take out the hospital out of storage and put it somewhere in Cassidy's and give some relief to OKEU and give some relief to the people of St. Lucia? But it's that lack of imagination, Mr. Speaker, that lack of sense of urgency that worries me. So even when the Prime Minister, the member from Cassidy's East, Mr. Speaker, wants to make references to what took place at the um, uh, custody suites, the prison. He knows, but he chooses not to repeat it, Mr. Speaker. The National Trust is a very special organization and that it identifies and posts historical buildings. <laughs> it has that right, Mr. Speaker. That's the strength the National Trust has. 
And when it goes around and it sees buildings of historic importance, it registers those buildings as historically important and significant buildings. What does that do, Mr. Speaker? That means if anybody applies to make any changes to those buildings in any way, that the first entity that must give the approval for that to take place is the National Trust. Very important, the National Trust. They would have the ultimate say. But it was interesting to note, Mr. Speaker, that the prison, which has been described by many people as a hellhole, and some persons saying that it should have been burnt down long ago, and that it's a shame of our own past, was never put as a historical building. Never. So in fact, the court case in which the National Trust took the government to court, the results of that court case was that the government acquiesced to the National Trust and said we will revisit it one more time. But the decision as to whether we're going to keep the building or not is ultimately and belongs solely to the government. So in fact, the architects and everybody tried to figure out exactly what the Prime Minister, I think that was he was trying to suggest, Mr. Speaker, as to how that old building could have been incorporated into the new building. And there was no way of doing it because the wall structure was not strong enough. It would not have been able to support that. So the idea was to take relics of it and incorporate it into the new courthouse and the new police headquarters that were going to be created. So Mr. Speaker, I think that most St. Lucians now have picked up on the fact that while the, this government was in opposition, that they made a lot of wild allegations. Not dissimilar to the minister's presentation that I heard, and I know I'm not allowed to go down that road, and I'll leave that for another day. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, the members on the opposite side don't have any imagination. And I'm concerned that they're bringing this bill to the house, this motion to the house, simply to try to have a quid pro quo with the National Trust in order to get the National Trust to allow them to hold the Jazz Festival, rather than making a permanent investment in the Pigeon Island, creating a stage that can be used all year, can create jobs for young people, Mr. Speaker, that we'd have jobs where musicians can be hired full time. We have dancers that could be hired full time. We can have actors that are, actor, are going to be hired full time and put our arts on display in the premier location in the world, Pigeon Island. And that it would significantly enhance for locals because we get a cultural experience. Gone are the days when a, a, a friends of yours come down and you have somewhere other than Friday night at Grosley to take them. That we'd be able to take them to a cultural show. Those are the things, Mr. Speaker. If we're going to integrate and benefit from tourism, let's do it. But this idea that you want to believe, make it believe that the members on the opposite side and the United Workers Party in particular, Mr. Speaker, don't have a vision with National Trust. We do. We support the National Trust. We think they play a very important role. And as an environmental group, we do. But we, we have questions and we're going to challenge them when it comes to the commercial development of the properties. It cannot be that the taxpayers of this country are going to be asked year after year to keep putting money into the National Trust and there's no accountability. And I think that the direction that the government is going in, because the government certainly has not offered any explanation as to any dialogue that they've had with National Trust, to say that the trust is going to change its ways, is going to, how is it going to make investments, why is the VAT money needed? The VAT money tells me that things are financially worse with the trust than ever before. And if we think making them not have to pay VAT is going to solve the problem, it's not. We need, to, we need to work with the trust to get them to understand that they have two very clear objectives that are in conflict with each other. One is a conservationist and the other one is to be able to develop properties. You know, Mr. Speaker, I remember when we first did the Jazz Festival and Coco, Coco Charles, when we applied to the National Trust to host the first jazz festival on Pigeon Island. The National Trust said no, Mr. Speaker. They turned down the St. Lucia Tourist Board. And the person who called me when I was a young director of tourism at that point, called me and said, was Coco Charles, he said, Mr. Chastney, can you take me and explain to me what the vision for Pigeon Island is and jazz festival? 
And I took him there. For those of us who are old enough, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you and I are probably in that, in that category. The first jazz festival, if you remember, the stage was facing um, uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean and was at the bottom, right? And when I took him there and I said, look, you have a stage down below, which you're now looking to Turtle Island, the Bird's Island, and then you're also looking back now at the Pigeon Island itself, and all the wind comes from the back, Mr. Speaker. And that there was this amp natural amphitheater that was there. And Coco Charles cried. And he said, you know what? I have come, I've been here my whole life, Mr. Speaker. And I have never seen that. And it was he, Mr. Speaker, that was able to go and convince the rest of the National Trust, Robert DeVoe and the others, to allow us to put the pigeon on. And you know, Mr. Speaker, the first time we built the stage, Mr. Speaker, okay? they would not allow us to put the metal stakes in the ground, okay? In fact, we had to build the stage on stones. And I remember after we, we had to steal, we had to steal, we had to steal the, the piano, Mr. Speaker, from the cultural center, okay? And brought it up there. And I remember Winton Marcellus going up to play and he could not believe he was gonna go and play on stones. So Mr. Speaker, there's a history. And the fact is, is that we have spent millions of dollars every year on the Jazz Festival. Millions. And that's just the Jazz Festival. Far less the other festivals that have taken place on Pigeon Island. Okay? And the question is, is that good value? So if we're going to spend the money and we all recognize the value and the importance of Pigeon Island as a landmark, something that's going to distinguish us, make us a marquee destination, why is it we can't sit down with the, with the National Trust? And the fact is the National Trust is the custodian and are the custodians of Pigeon Island. And there's no way that me as a government was going to force them to do anything, but I certainly wanted them to know and appreciate that you cannot continue to expect that the state should fund all of your losses. And that's my concern, Mr. Speaker. I'm not hearing anything in the presentation today, and I'm hoping that the Prime Minister in his rebuttal will deal with that. How are you going to hold the trust accountable so that this money is not wasted? How are we going to be satisfied in this house, Mr. Speaker? Representing our constituents, representing the taxpayers of this country, Mr. Speaker. How are we going to be satisfied that this money that we're giving them, because this is, this is taxpayers' money, in exempting them from having to pay the VAT is money that would normally be coming to the state. Instead, we're allowing the trust to maintain those monies. How are we going to be assured? I've heard nothing in the presentation today, Mr. Speaker, that would give me any comfort that the National Trust is, is recognizing their conflict, is going to make an effort to meet their own um, cost, and more importantly, that they're going to add value to the destination of St. Lucia through historical sites and through our culture. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Member for Castry Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it was never an intention to have discourse or to contribute to what I felt, Mr. Speaker, would have been a motion passed flawlessly and with the concurrence of all members. But you see, Mr. Speaker, sometimes persons have to show their true colors. And in that regard, I refer to no other than the member for Mikud South. Mr. Speaker, he went down memory lane and I might just go there a bit. He has distinguished himself, Mr. Speaker, in the last four prime ministers that this country was fortunate to have. Three of them supported St. Jude. Three of them supported St. Jude. One called it the old St. Jude. And having spent about seven million dollars on two buildings he demolished them and today he speaks of accountability today mr speaker he spoke of health services let me touch on that quickly and he referred to a letter which i had described in a different forum and for which they felt they should lambast me but as i always say mr speaker once you jump in the political arena, your back must be broadened and you must be prepared to take the blows. But refutal is mandatory. Mr. Speaker, as far as health is concerned, the member for Miku South 
told two categorical lies or untruths, if you want to call lie unparliamentary. Both the Leclerc and Entripo Health Centers are operational. Both of them are operational. He indicated earlier that none of the health centers in the Castries basins are working. So that is lie number one. Mama, I said, listen. Mampu miku sauf diko satale ala. Pani yo health center kastri kika kika tuavai. Mwevle di sapa vwe ek um, health center maasi kako pwensana di actual ma. Health center la kleri ek health center entry po katuavai. That is the first one. Mr. Speaker, he spoke about health care being the worst. And this, here is substantiation. A letter written by an author who invariably, who invariably, you see sometimes, Mr. Speaker, what they do, they take the cap of a supporter, place it on the heart, on the heads with professionalism, and then say they speak as a professional. So they are supporters of the party, but working, operating as professionals. Mr. Speaker, let me say this. Oh, yes, he did. And he op I'm entering, I'm entering. Let me say this. And the records are clear, Mr. Speaker, because I remembered it. I went to do my research. Under Philip Joseph Pierre, the Ministry of Health has received the greatest allocation ever in the history of St. Louis. Member, please refer to the member by his portfolio. His, um, sorry, sorry. My bad, Mr. Speaker. Under the leadership of Abba leadership, Premier Minister Mampu Castries is Minister Te Apeisala. How we suve please la han passe yo jeme juen depi nuni yo government asetlisi, and that is a fact. The records are there, and I can substantiate it. I will on Thursday. The greatest allocations are under the leadership of this current Prime Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, and he went on to say the letter says, the letter says. But when you juxtapose the contents of the letter and the apparent castigation of the government by the author, one needs to ask, is it that same person, was it that very author who once said, Mr. Speaker, when someone died on the floor of a hospital, he would have died anyway? Was it that same person? I don't know who it is, but I'm asking. And was it this member for Miku South who had gone to England and indicated to the people of England that he's trying his best for healthcare, but the person died? I don't know if it's good, I don't know if it's bad, but the person died. And then he, was, he asked them, Am I being arrogant? And they responded unequivocally, yes, you are being arrogant. The records are there. Today, today, you are coming and talk about healthcare. Greatest allocation. Recently, Mr. Speaker, OKEU was given by the government of this country using the very CIP funds, $11 million, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, Pharmaceuticals were paid. Pharmaceuticals were paid to the tune of $4 million receivables that preceded our time. The total receivables we met there was $17 million. And slowly but surely, payable, sorry, payable, sorry. Total payables, that's quite a part from the allocation, the mainstream allocation. The Prime Minister gave them $11 million and created a significant indentation in the payables of four out of $17 million. All of this was inherited from the last administration. You see, Mr. Speaker, we were moving from, Oak, from Victoria to OKU, and we had St. Lucians who were going to cause us to move for next to nothing but we imported a group of people called the Cayman Group. And we were paying them, Mr. Speaker, in excess of a million dollars a month. 
they enjoyed a two-year contract for a sum of $25 million. That 20, and we, as a government, when we came in, we had to come to this honorable house to borrow money to pay debts incurred by the last administration because of the egregious deeds. And you have the audacity, the goal, the gunner to open your mouth and talk about healthcare, man. Huh? Talk about healthcare. You know, if some autism was a, a, a disease that could have been visible, Mr. Speaker, it would have been visible as it relates to the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, man talks about no ideas, we're wasting money, there is no accountability. I cannot believe it is this leader of the opposition. We had a mall, Mr. Speaker, valued at $60 million, and I, know I need not make it a document of the House. I've done so several times. It was valued at $60 million. You sold it for 13 and a half million. And apart from... Member from Miku South. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, you know, we've been down this road before. The member is misleading the House, Mr. Speaker. <sighs> okay. The mall was valued at 60 Member million. Member, can your seat? Can you take your seat? We sold the ground floor for $30 million, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. We still own the upstairs part, and we did it through a bolt arrangement, Mr. Speaker. So again, this is a matter of, of a court case. This is a matter of, of that's still pending in court, and a parliamentary issue in which I was asked to apologize, and the facts speak for themselves. All the facts show that the ground floor was sold for $30 million, Mr. Speaker, okay? and the upstairs part was retained. Mr. Speaker. Sorry, the downstairs was sold for $15 million, Mr. Speaker. Half of the amount, Mr. Speaker. Member for Central, please proceed. Yes, I will. Because, Mr. Speaker, time and time again, I've provided this Honorable House with documentary evidence of my assertions. I've shown the deed of sale. I've made it a document of this House on several occasions, and I'm sure Mr. Speaker is seized of the document. There is a deed of sale, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you what there is next. I'll tell you what there is. Talking about we sold ground floor. I'll tell you what there is, Mr. Speaker. Having sold the property, valued at $60 million for $5 million US. Okay? Having sold it, he tied us to an agreement for 16 and a half years. He tied us to an agreement of 16 and a half years in which we pay about... Now, I say about, Mr. Speaker, because it may fluctuate. Imagine in the lease agreement, there are charges that fluctuate based on what is paid at the time, in terms of electricity and other utilities. But the minimum, Mr. Speaker, is a million dollars a month for 16 and a half years, coming to a total of, in the region of, if my memory serves me right, $198 million. You sold the ground floor. You sold which ground floor? One, let's sit this year. Après, il peut m'en la quitter vale 60 million dollars. Even if pour 12 million, ma si ka repose m'a dit là. Even if pour 12 million, 47 million moins, 47 million dollars short. You're talking about 99,000 dollars. 47 million dollars short. And on top of that, Il ka fe gouvernement loue même place la pou pli passe yon milyon dola pa mwa pou sez la de edimi. Sa se an krev tche. Ek pies moun ki e me pe yo pa ka fe pe yo sa. Hundred and ninety eight million dollars. Talk about no transparency. Mr. Speaker, the Tio Aking agreement and the the, the culprits are in this place. The T.O. King agreement. Thousand acres, dollar an acre. Some of the land was sold. It was actually transferred at three dollars and seventy cents a square foot. You know, you do that to your country, man. Three dollars and seventy cents a square foot of land close to the airport. Land close. Take it, boy, and put Lale set this year. 
qui savent pour 40 dollars papier carré. Il peut y venir avec Tio Hacking pour 3 dollars et qui est en You know, you do that to your country and you love this country. Which country you love? You took 7.3 million dollars, gave to your brother, a man doing business with your brother-in-law for vaccine. Where is our vaccine money? Where, he has paid part. Where is the rest? Où ka pwè la jan nou? Où ka pwè la jan nou? Où ka bay? Nou pa nou ime de l'hôpital. Moun ka bon a te a la ou te poumye benis. Ou a ilok li te ka pale. Yo di te ka ilmo anyway. Nou pa ni la jan. Me ou ka pwè 7 milyon dola. Because nou mna ka fè business. Ek brother in law. Ou ka bay 7 for 3 milyon dola. Ek jis toujou. Nou po kohen tout la. You know? And up to now, we don't get vaccines. And you have the audacity to talk about transparency and accountability, man. Huh? You have the audacity? You know, Mr. Speaker, I heard him talk about range. Range. You know, Mr. Speaker, let me just say this. When the CIP program was developed and the member for, me, for Viewfort South was prime minister, there was an immaculate piece of legislation that accompanied its introduction. First thing, Mr. Speaker, there was a limit on the amount of passports that any agent could have issued. Ask the leader of the opposition who removed that limit. Ask him. It was him. He removed the number of passports to facilitate to your king. Let's talk about escrow. Mr. Speaker, the law, as it was then, mandated the establishment of an escrow account in this country. Who permitted T.O. King to set up an escrow account overseas? Madei Saleh said, listen. Member for Miku South. Mr. Speaker, again, the member is misleading the House. Um, Galaxy, I mean, uh, DSH, T.O. King never had any escrow account approved overseas, ever. There was no passport sold by DSH. There was no passports allocated under Alpina. There's nothing. The members in court with me making allegations that I gave to a king uh, passports. I'm looking forward to that day coming very soon I in the court, but I want to make it very clear. There was never an escrow account for DSH or Tara King. There was never any passports allocated or uh, shares allocated or ever sold to Taylor King or to DSH. And I would like the member please to withdraw that statement because Never. it is absolutely a lie. Never. Member of Castro Central, the member from Miku South has indicated that the government has never approved an escrow account for DSH and wishes for you to withdraw that no, statement. No, I'm not good. Mr. Speaker, clause 7-2 of the agreement speaks of the escrow account and I can tell you I undertake to make it a document of the house very soon. Clause 7.2 says, and I believe I remember it verbatim, try and get it for me please. 7.2 says The document that, is already a documented house. Oh, it's a, ah, thank you very much Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. In there, the agreement signed by those two gentlemen, the member for Miku South and the member for Sozel Saltibus. It gave the developer the authority to open an account overseas in his name. And when the project is completed, the balance of the funds in that account belongs to him. Member for Miku South. Mr. Speaker, the agreement the member refers to, and I kept on saying this, is not a binding agreement. Okay? These, yeah. these, were, these were the terms, these were the terms that were set out for negotiation, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to say it again, Mr. Speaker, very clearly. There has never been and there is no agreement that exists ever that allows DSH or Taylor King to open up an escrow account. There is no agreement that was ever finalized, put together, and, and approved by both parties. Okay? This was, certainly, this was a, a, an agreement that was originally negotiated by the then opposition. But it is not a binding agreement. This is what they requested, and it's subject to approvals on both sides. It was never agreed to. 
That is why the member cannot provide, or the member of CIP, cannot provide one contract, one contract, or one example of where a passport was sold or any money from CIP monies were used in the member, SH member, member the member South, the member of Acastri has never referenced I passport never being that. sold or monies being, that doesn't mean a passport is sold. Well, that's a different story. Let me make it very clear. There is no escrow account. There's no agreement that shows that there's an escrow account that allows, sorry? What's it called again? Mr. Speaker, for Ms. purposes no. of elucidation, I am equipped. Member of Acacia Central, please hold on. Are you finished, Member from Eco South? <laughs> Member from Eco South, are you finished? Yes. Proceed. Mr. Speaker, I have the agreement signed by the leader of the opposition and the member for Swazel. I have it on my phone. I will read Clause 7. I will read Clause 7 because when you want to come here and lie, we have the evidence. The remember, master developer... Remember, don't use those words, please. Sorry, ma'am. Yes. The, ma the master developer shall open a new bank account in its own name with a duly licensed international banking institution outside St. Lucia and all, all design, and shall designate such bank account as the escrow account. The monies received for investment in the project of CIP participants shall be deposited into this account and used in accordance with clause 7.2. And you say member, member of Castle Central. Member from Eco South. Speaker, if the member would continue to read the agreement, if he wants to read the entire <laughs> agreement, you, you will see that the agreement no says call. that all of these things are but subject to the laws no of St. Lucia and final negotiation. Those are things that are put you down as terms and requests that they wanted, but they have to be approved individually, Mr. Speaker. So you can, you can read whatever you want. None of those, he cannot provide any evidence. They're in government for three and a half years, Mr. Speaker. If the member wants me to, the member said that if I was able to prove that DSH bought any land, that he would remove himself and never speak about the subject. I'm not holding him to it because I know he knew he was lying from the beginning. I am lying. But the fact is, remember, is that just, the member. I just the member, remember, Mikusa, I just cautioned the member about using the word lie. Okay. The member, thank you. Okay. Misled the House, Mr. Speaker. Okay. The member cannot provide a contract that shows that the DSH and that? the government of St. Lucia opened up an escrow account. account. They, it does not exist. But he didn't say that, member. You keep saying that. But he he did said say permission was given. No, he never no, said no an account was open. That's the point. That's not permission. That's, That's the point permission. of negotiation. Member of a Cassie permission Central, is when we have signed proceed. an agreement. Member, yes, then you have yes. permission. Let, member from let, Microsoft, let, come me, on. Let, let me read again. Let me just read it again, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The master developer shall open a new bank account in its own name with a duly licensed international banking institution outside St. Lucia and shall designate each bank account as this bank account as the escrow account. The money is received for investment in the project from CIP participants shall be the and I'm a lawyer, shall be deposited into this account and used in, a, in accordance with clause 7.2. That is what it says shall and it goes on on the 7.4. Following completion, any funds in the escrow account shall belong to the master developer and the withdrawal process is no longer applicable. Member, member of Akashi Central, member from Eco South. Mr. Speaker, the member is making reference to a framework agreement. <laughs> a framework <laughs> agreement is not the final agreement. Framework agreement is exactly what it says. It's the frame of an agreement. And each has to be approved individually per the laws of St. Lucia. The government was not in a position to approve any escrow account because that is the purview of the CIP unit. They had not even applied to the CIP unit. They would have to apply to the CIP. You know, Mr. Speaker, we go through this exact same thing when we talk about a planning approval. Cabinet does not have the authority to give any developer planning approval. Cabinet, Cabinet not does true. not have the that's authority to give people alien landlords licenses. That's okay? They have to go through a process of Mr. Speaker, application. Can I Mr. proceed, Speaker. please? Okay? Can I proceed? So you're saying to me that the Cabinet has the authority to have given somebody proceed? an escrow account? 
Come on, guys. Mr. This is a Speaker, framework agreement. All, all and, this, I said. And, and again, if the member wants, if the member wants me to back down on this statement, provide to this House as he has promised the agreement between DSH or by Alpina for an escrow account. Alpina. And then I will be quiet and show where there was any money transferred. In. He's in government. He has access to everything. What are you talking about? Because so, there, there is none. Oh, that was in a framework it. agreement, no, and it was no never, no never, never manifested into a contract. No Mr. Speaker. But remember, Castries, hold on. The debate on this matter of permission to open an escrow account is over. Very well. On the basis of what you have said and what you have read, yes. there is nothing inconsistent between the two. Very Please well. proceed. And I have the last page just to top it up, Mr. Speaker, bearing the signature of the leader of the opposition and the member for Suzel Saltibus. Very well. So, yes, Mr. Speaker. You know, then let's move on. Let's move on, Mr. Speaker. To facilitate this deal, they bought incinerators. $11 million. How much? $11 million on incinerators that never worked. Never worked. On top of that, they built a bypass road to facilitate this again for $15 million, Mr. Speaker. $15 million. Permandu. How much we gave Permandu again? $13 million. $13 million, Mr. Speaker. Ernst and Young, our people have been accustomed from time immemorial. We have never had a prime minister who sought outside assistance to prepare our budgetary estimates. Never until this leader of the opposition stepped in and having given Ernst and Young, he said it was 1%. I rather said, it, I rather believe it was more. You know, paid Ernst and Young millions of dollars and after he, he realized that he was denting the coffers of this country and whereas we have the in-house ability, he stopped it. And today has the audacity, the gonad to talk about accountability. Mr. Speaker, today I was happy to see persons, persons that were um, exercising the constitutional right of freedom of association, a right enshrined in the Constitution, and as a lawyer, I support it. But I'll tell you what, I will not quarrel only with the 17 that were dressed in Flabo or the other 20 that were dressed. They don't want to be seen to be identified in Flabo. But, you know, Mr. Speaker, at the core of this is a government that will not stop anyone from exercising their constitutional rights. You remember what happened when the leader of the opposition was prime minister for over five years? Never could the average citizen of this country come so close to parliament. You all remember that? You all remember that? Member for Swazel, not even you they could come and touch. You, you were barricaded. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Today, the speaker and other members of government said we are not doing that to our people. We are not doing that to our people. Give them the right to associate and so remove the barriers. And over three years, you have not seen one barrier to prevent an average solution from coming to see the persons they elected, Mr. Speaker. And then you're talking about... <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you know, we are dealing with the National Trust. And I always knew that from the time Mr. Tulsi, who was then the managing director, from the time I realized there was a back and forth between the leader of the opposition at the time, Prime Minister, and Mr. Tulsi, I knew we would have heard the consequence of such back and forth. And so, Mr. Speaker, he used the mighty sword and he stopped the subvention. And that's the first time in the history of this country again. The National Trust was, no, he didn't, yeah, he withheld it. <laughs> you know, the National Trust was formed by Sir John George Melvin Compton, who was then Prime Minister. Notwithstanding, he now heads the party that this icon, Julian Hunt. Okay, good. 
I stand corrected. But Sir John ensured they got the subvention and it started with 200,000. It reached 700,000 under us. He, well, he, he bolstered it. You know, you came in, Mr. Speaker. The National Trust is the repository. We depend on tourism. And all our natural assets, if we let go, we will not have anything to attract tourists down here. We will not. And so it was felt that some kind of subsidy had to be given. And he came. And because of a, an altercation, supposedly, he just swiped it and say, no longer will you get any sub subvention. You know what happened then, Mr. Speaker? I had to go to the Prime Minister because the subvention was being used to protect one of the homes of one of our Nobel laureates. You remember that, Mr. P and instantaneously, I got a call from National Trust, Mr. Minister, we can no longer pay the salary of the security. That was the ramifications of his behavior. And guess what? I asked city council to foot the bill until the government uh, um, restored the subvention. And thank God, as prime minister, leader of the government, a man who's patriotic to the country, the member for Miku East, uh, for Castries East, and prime minister, reinstalled the subsidy to national trust. I believe it is the wrong. So all of that is we, and then you have. One of his members calling the member for, for Castries is wicked. <laughs> Wickedness resides in the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. So when you talk all the nonsense, and you know, the audacity, the call, the call of this man, the daughter of a man who was an icon, the founder of the party you now leads, was supposed to get a job but for approval by the prime minister and guess what guess what he did not approve it she don't like my party you come and meet the people thing here like Javini, she don't like my party you have party where you have party you get the people thing there she don't like my party so you didn't approve it and then call people wicked man you know, I can go on and on, Mr. Speaker, but I have to leave. I have to leave. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, when you have a man who has lost his way, and all they do is they preach violence. They preach violence. Everything that comes from their mouth is for upheaval. They want to disturb the peace and tranquility of this country, Mr. Speaker. But that will not happen because our people are of resolve. Never before... In fact, for the last 32 years, we never enjoyed three consecutive years of growth over 3%. It happened right now, Mr. Speaker. And the, the ECCB is projecting over 7% for this financial year. And in our last year, 4.5%. That would mean, in the history of this country, the only time for five consecutive years in any government administration that there would have been growth in the economy of 3.4% and more consecutively for five years. The greatest growth they achieved was 3.4%, which is the worst that this government has achieved. So, Mr. Speaker, with these few words, let's turn Munka Pali, let's leader of opposition, Nakadu, set lisier, di set lisier, that set lisier, Pavle, di set lisier, li yon giga Pali, e giga Pali by Koi, e giga Pali by Dotu Amun, ki man konet man yepou fe desod. But majority set lisier, majority set lisier, satisfe e gouvernement, satisfe e sa gouvernement en kafe, e ki yoka sati, yoka sati en koyo, dat yon yon relief. A paya, a release up a cali pies coti because a mahavita le premier minister kuye election yo kai ni o chance pu matche nu et me sab a tout disset constituency me kadi swaze nu kavini me kadi mi kusav nu kavini because a tout disset constituency cannot sa a country a kakete a kakite a ko passagi tout le disset. Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I thank you. I 
Um. Member Vakashi Central, can you turn off your microphone? Sorry. Member for Miku North. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I wish Mr. Speaker to contribute briefly to the motion which seeks to exempt the St. Lucia National Trust from the payment of VAT. And Mr. Speaker, I support this motion. I want Mr. Speaker, before I speak, to just ask for a few moments to wish my constituents and the whole of St. Lucia a wonderful Je Que all week. I know that many people are preparing. I know that many communities are preparing. And it is a, a time where we celebrate our heritage. It's a time where we reflect on the past, but also a time where we use the traditions of the past to try to bring back community, bring back togetherness, um, recall the strategies that were used by our grandparents to, to survive harsh economic times, because tradition and celebrations of heritage is not just for the fit, Mr. Speaker. It, it recalls a time where we, we use kudme to survive harsh economic realities. And while we are modernizing, we, are, we have come to realize that some of these traditions are very useful to cure some of the challenges we are having in our societies today. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to support the motion that the Premier Minister has made to take the vote by the Senusha National Trust. But before I say that, I want to say that all the people of the North and all the people of the North have a good journey and a good semaine. It's important because when we talk about the journey of the North, we talk about the people of the North, we talk about the people of the North, we talk about the people of the North, nous aimons danser avec nous aimons langage nous avec nous aimons bon manger. C'est important mais monsieur speaker ça fait journée créole qu'a fait nous changer qui manière grand grand à elle nous et grand maman nous et grand papa nous vive et qui manière tant et wed et qui manière yo vive qui manière yo tenir couai là yo nia pour mener nous devant et pour ban nous éducation et pour ban nous sagesse là nous ni à présent. So it's very important. So let's have a safe and wonderful Jeune Creole. You will find me, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you know already, during the weekend, playing my drums, reciting my Creole poems, something the opposition believes is a very negative thing. But Mr. Speaker, I stand to support this motion and to say to you, Mr. Speaker, that I am not surprised that the opposition, and especially the leader of the opposition, will be against anything that has to do with support to the National Trust. And no matter how he tries to, to, to capture it, no matter how he tries to craft it, this leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, if you listen to him well, from way back when, from when he was in the Senate, way back when, if you listen to what he says, everything he says speaks about his character, it speaks about how he crafts St. Lucianness. Anything that has to do with St. Lucia, coming out of the bowels of our history, coming out of the bowels of our struggles, the leader of the opposition opposes it. And you go back to his history. You look at his policies in government. And even now, Mr. Speaker, anything that has to do with our St. Lucianness, the leader of the opposition opposes it. Remember when he, speak, when he spoke about our, our patrimony and our credit rating? Remember that? Remember when he, he offered Sandy Beach to T.O. Aking? You remember that? You remember when he decided that a large portion of Viewfort should not belong to Viewfortians and St. Lucians? but belong 
to somebody with an escrow account overseas? Remember that? Remember when he called us jackasses and backing dogs? You remember that? You remember when he said that we have lost our right to speak simply because we were in the opposition? Do you remember that? You remember when he removed the subvention of the National Trust? And when you think about all of these actions, Mr. Speaker, you get to understand why the leader of the opposition will not support the National Trust. And of course, Mr. Speaker, every organization, toute organisation à cette liste, ça travaille avec gouvernement, avec l'année bagaille pour manger, toute organisation. But why is it the leader of the opposition is always against anything that comes out of the bowels of our traditions, our struggles, and our history? Why is it, Mr. Speaker, and all organizations, all organizations, Mr. Speaker, when you think about the history, the Calypsos, the Calypsonians, it's like you want to say that the leader of the opposition just does not like St. Lucia, does not like St. Lucians, Mr. Speaker. I can't help but say this. Do you recall when the horsemen and the horse lead people who train and ride horses in Viewfort, and that's been a long tradition, supported by the member of parliament for Viewfort South, and many others. Do you recall those races on, on what we call the Kakabef? And do you recall the tradition of horse racing? And when DSH came about, the young men and young people in Viewfort tried to negotiate and say, well, there is a horse race. Can we race our Creole horses there? You remember the rebuke? You think they would allow these young horse men and women who, who have the tradition in horsemanship to race on the track know what they did, Mr. Speaker. And it's very symbolic. It was very symbolic. The symbolism in all of this is very important. They ensured that they went there with all of their, their glowing feathered hats and their high top hats in the hot burning sun with three-piece suits to ensure that all of St. Lucia saw what they stood for, Mr. Speaker. That is what this is about. The attack on the National Trust is not different to the attack on all of our local institutions. And they speak about health, very passionate about that topic, health. And who is doing better in health, who is not doing better in health. I have said to people before, I have no barometer to compare and measure who do better in health who ain't do better in health. Because anytime somebody falls sick, we fall sick. Any one of us sitting here can end up at any health institution. Any one of us. And therefore, I have no time to measure what he say or what that one say. Our style in this government has been any professional, whether it be a teacher, a school principal, a lawyer, a doctor, a mechanic, any professional who raise, any professional who raises issues in the manner of conduct of the operations of this government, our style has been to call them in, sit with them, and say, yes, it looks like we have problems over there. How can we solve these problems together? I am not in the business of quarreling or debating with any doctor or any nurse. I am not in that business. Our business is to fix the problems that we found and to ensure that we put the resources in the hospitals, in the health centers, in the procurement processes to improve the conditions of healthcare in this country. But Mr. Speaker, I can't help but say to you, the same thing he speaks about when he speaks about national trust is the same thing with healthcare. And it's important when they raise these issues to, to, to point you and to remind you of the history. Because elections have consequences, Mr. Speaker. When the member of parliament for Viefort South, Viefort South was prime minister, he and his cabinet colleagues worked very hard to ensure that we built a state-of-the-art hospital. They worked with the French. Because as you know, 
France contributed tremendously or in large measure to the hospital, the Owen King E. Hospital. They worked with Dr. Dabor, the Honorable Dabor, and so many other professions, long-standing traditions of cooperation and professionalism with the hospital in Martinique. We lost government in 2016. The transition from Victoria Hospital to the Owen King E Hospital was set. The member of parliament for VFO South as prime minister, everything was set. Dr. Owen King led this transi tr transition process. Stephen King, sorry. Stephen King, Owen King was his dad. Dr. Stephen King and others. And they did it out of the goodness of their heart and out of, out of the love that they have for St. Lucia. And they said, they raised their hands and they said, we are going to make this happen. St. Lucians, with the help of our friends in Martinique and in other places, we have an opportunity to have a world-class facility. We have to change the processes from Victoria Hospital into this new facility. We cannot go in there in the very same way. We have to change the financing. All of these problems were recognized. And for decades and decades and decades, we have been grappling with this issue of healthcare. How do we, first of all, finance it? And how do we ensure we have better facilities? And how do we ensure we have better procedures? And the process started. We lost the elections in 2016. The facility remained there. 2017. 2018, 2019. The leader of the opposition was prime minister. They left the building there, deteriorating. And they were grappling with issues at the Victoria Hospital. When he speaks about, when he speaks about what doctors are saying that we are going through now, when, we, when he speaks about those things, Mr. Speaker, as I've said before, as I've said before, I will not TMTA, I will not TMTA with anybody about Mr. Speaker, I will not. You will never find me. You will never find me debating or T.A. Metain with the leader of the opposition or anybody else about a comparison between what happened before, what's happening now, what will happen tomorrow at the bedsides of patients and between interactions of patients with doctors. I, am, I will never go there. Because if he wants to talk about stories, there are many solutions with a lot of stories. And these stories are not stories of over the last three years. There are solutions with a lot of stories. And I have a lot of these stories. Some of them recorded. Some of them written. I received letters when I became Minister for Health. Tons of letters about stories. So we can talk about stories, but our resolve is not to go there. Our resolve is to fix the problems that we found. And our resolve is to fix them, whether they are emergencies that arise or whether they are systemic problems that we must fix. The Member of Parliament for VFO South left a system, left a plan, left professionals in place. The member of parliament for Miku South came in as prime minister. And he destroyed that. He dumped it. Again, for him, there is not enough in the belly of St. Lucians and in the belly of the St. Lucian society to be able to transition a hospital. That is what it, mean, it meant. That for the leader of the opposition, who is Dr. King to come and transition hospital for him? For, for the leader of the opposition, Dr. King and the other doctors, 
are out of the traditions and the bellies of St. Lucia. He could not feel and believe that our people could do it. So what did he do? He disbanded them. There were relationships that were established between St. Lucia and Martinique. Like your couille there, c'est français. Your couille there, c'est français. And the people in Martinique, the professionals, were going to do it free of charge. Free of charge. When I listen to the member of parliament from Miku South talk about health care, you come, want to talk about health care? Everything was set. And you know what? They destroyed it. And for approximately $25 million, they brought in a group from Cayman called Cayman, Cayman City and their associates. And his plan, and he said it on television with Rick Wayne, his plan was to privatize the institutions. And he said, do you believe a private entity will come and just do that for, for, for nothing? That was their plan, to privatize the institutions. And they were also going for the St. Jude Hospital for profit. Mr. Speaker, when they talk about health care, privatize it for, for profit. Mr. Speaker, the transition from Victoria Hospital to Owen King EU Hospital was rushed, disorganized, without thought, because the COVID-19 pandemic forced the then government to do what they should have done long time ago. On March 20th, 2020, on March 20th, 2020, they were forced to move the hospital. So how do you expect to move a hospital, to transition a hospital with a forced movement? They were forced because they remained from 2016 up to 2020, and nothing was done to transition the hospital to OKEU. And all of the debt, all of the payables, all of the problems were shifted to the Owen King EU Hospital. COVID-19 taught us a big lesson. The COVID-19 pandemic in St. Lucia, the last set of protocols were really in 2022, between September to December of 2022. So all of this time, when we came into government, we were dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic until 2022, December, when things started to, that was the first year we started to have a, a Christmas where people were a little free up. December 2022. So the hospital, like other hospitals in St. Lucia, like the St. Jude Hospital and other health facilities, were grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic, Delta variant in particular. We suffered much. And so, Mr. Speaker, with the rushed movement to the OKEU hospital, no systems could have been put in place. And instead of getting our people who understand our system to work with the transition, they hired for two years for $25 million an organization, a company, which was steadily going to privatization. And then you talk about health care and what they're saying about health care. Mr. Speaker, as soon as we came in, we were dealing with COVID-19 and also dealing with the challenges of the hospitals. And our resolve, our resolve, Mr. Speaker, was to ensure that we work with the boards of directors of both hospitals to cause there to be order in the processes at the hospitals. So of course there are challenges. Of course there are challenges. Challenges with supplies. Challenges with professionals. Who has decided that, you know, after being on leave, on, on, on paid leave with the hospital for a while, decided, well, you know what, I'm going to move on. Those who have decided not to renew their contract. And those who have decided when they are not renewing their contract, they would write to us and tell us what some of the long-standing issues are. And we have accepted that we are working with all professionals, all medical professionals, all non-medical professionals of the hospitals to ensure that we cause things to do better. So yes, there are problems. And we are not running away from the problems. 
like you run away from the problems, and instead of continuing the St. Jude Hospital project, you, 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 you mash up the buildings. We are not doing that. We are facing the challenges head on. And so, Mr. Speaker, in this very, in this very atmosphere of consultation, we met a number of months ago with both the St. Jude Hospital and the Millennium Hospital administrations. And the Prime Minister met with them. The Cabinet of Ministers met with them because we felt that these issues were serious long before some of those issues came into the public do domain. We met with them and we agreed with them on a plan of action. This plan of action includes ex exempting a number of medical pieces of medical equipment from VAT. We have done so before and we have received from the Medical and Dental Association on the 17th of Oct in October, Mr. Speaker, October 17th, we received a list from the Medical and Dental Association. It is a, a very long list of medical equipment that they want us to exempt from VAT. Pardon me? Medical equipment. But we are not, we are not, no, no, no. They want us to exempt a number of pieces of equipment, very important equipment, from VAT so that it can be used in, in practice in St. Lucia. In private practice. We are going to consider it. The Member of Parliament for Cast for, for Castries East did so a year and a half ago. We did some of MRIs and that kind of thing, and we are going to consider the, medical, the list of medical equipment, have consultations to see which ones we are going to we are going to return to the parliament with to exempt from VAT. Some of these pieces of equipment include diagnostic equipment, radiology, dental equipment, general surgery, emergency, internal medicine, psychiatry, gynecology, ophthalmology, and so on. We'll continue to update you, Mr. Speaker, so that when we come back to parliament, we will deal with it. We continue to take concrete actions to ensure that we assist the hospitals with increased human resources, to ensure that we deal with the issue of the emergencies. And over the last few months, we have seen a rapid increase in emergencies at both St. Jude Hospital, emergency admissions at both St. Jude Hospital and the Owen King EO Hospital. A rapid increase. And therefore, this government is doing what it must to ensure that we deal with the healthcare situation. This is in addition to the other programs that we have started. Mr. Speaker, we came in and found a number of our wellness centers, some of them requiring complete rehabilitation. And we have started the rehabilitation of some. We have started the refurbishment of some. We have started providing new equipment to many of them. And the process continues. We understand the frustration of some of the staff in some of the wellness centers where there is mold and work has to be done in the, uh, in the ceiling, work has to be done on the floors, we have to repaint, repaint, replace the paints, all of that to ensure that the quality of services we give, we provide service at the highest quality. At this time, we are dealing with the Viewfort Wellness Center, the Babuno Wellness Center, and others. Tremendous work has to happen there to ensure that we do, we change the ceiling and do work on the floors and so on to ensure that we improve the situation there. Mr. Speaker, I want to say to you that we are committed. In addition to providing ambulances to the fire services, we are committed to providing even more resources to the rest of the, of the health sector. The St. Jude Hospital Rehabilitation Project is coming on stream, and there are changes that are being made. There are changes that are, that, that are being caused to take place at both hospitals to ensure that the, the processes in management happen in a much more resilient, much more satisfactory manner. So when he speaks about healthcare, Mr. Speaker, there will come a time when we will put the track record next to our track record and their track record. But the St. Lucia Labour Party government, not only this administration, but the administration under the Member of Parliament for VFO South started a revolution in health 
that was stopped by their government. Stopped by their government. And it's as if every time we have to start all over again. This thing about healthcare, Mr. Speaker, when we were in opposition, the things that we criticized in terms of the resources to health and so on, we can show you concrete evidence of where we've made differences. And we will continue to make differences. So, Mr. Speaker, I say to you, we are not intimidated by the name calling. We are not intimidated by what they read. Our resolve is to ensure that we fix the problems that we found and we make things better. Mr. Speaker, I wish to say to you that a very small but significant example will be demonstrated on Thursday. On Thursday morning, we will go to Deriso. We'll go to Deriso, and we are going to unveil a refurbished Lilia Haraxing Wellness Center. There is so. I should show you the conditions of the cupboards before it was rehabilitated by this government. I will show you the pictures, Mr. Speaker. Which constituency is The constituency of Miku South. And he was Prime Minister for over five years. And we are going to rename this health center in the honor to honor a long-standing stalwart of the community of Deriso and Miku South. A nurse who gave her whole life to nursing. And that is just a start, Mr. Speaker, to demonstrate our resolve. Very soon, the Member of Parliament for Denry North will give us the go-ahead for his wellness center, which is, which is complete. We are just... And again, the Member of Parliament for Viewfort South in 2016 allocated funds to refurbish the wellness center. The leader of the opposition came and they stopped it. He talked about health care. He spent five and a half years in government. And the people of Denry North did not get the wellness center. Well, anybody who goes to Denry North now at Larishus, you will see. The members say, don't go yet. Wait for the opening. You will see what we have done with the Larishus Wellness Center. New equipment, new facility for the people of Denry North. And there are other areas in the country that will receive similar treatment. The Grosile Polyclinic. We are moving towards 24-hour services to help the situation at OKEU. And in the coming months or early next year, you will hear more about it. New equipment coming for centers like the Viewfort Wellness Center for Maternal and Child Care. You will hear more about that in the next few months. So today is not the day, Mr. Speaker, to speak about the millions of dollars we have spent for new equipment at our hospitals, at our wellness centers, new training, new services in maternal and child care, new services for, for cancer screening in cervical cancer. The levy, the health and security levy, the leader of the opposition speaks so much about which only collects possibly a maximum of $35 million, is assisting health. Levy a ki nuka pay on the health and security. Nuka premier minister ka servi pou bay sector sante a si po. E ki pa me ma se, to run the Owen King EU hospital alone is close to $100 million a year. The St. Jude Hospital, currently, you need about $45 million a year. Their subvention is nothing close to that. So you can, and when we go to the new St. Jude Hospital, the cost will increase. So that is why the government is working very hard, both with the World Bank, with local professionals, and with consultants, to ensure that we have a health financing strategy and policy. 
so that we can finance healthcare in a sustainable way. That is part of the work and part of the mix. So when they are talking about healthcare and what the doctors say and what the dentists say and who say it was this way, that way, it's never been that way. I don't deal with those debates at all. The doctors who have complained, we have met with them face to face. We have met with them around the table. The Prime Minister has met with them. The Cabinet of Ministers met with them. And they told us what the issues are, whether they are immediate issues or long-standing issues. And we have taken steps. All of the steps have not been, all of the issues have not been resolved. We have taken steps to resolve the issues. Just a few days ago, Mr. Speaker, the Millennium Ice Medical Com Complex, Owen King E Hospital, cleared containers of supplies to ensure that we deal with the situation. Just a few days ago, the St. Jude Hospital, we are working with the St. Jude Hospital, first of, us, of all, to augment the staff, and very soon to look at their own payables. They have payables of possibly about $9 million, long, long, long standing payables. And Prime Minister has said, let us look at that. Even though we can't do everything now, let us help St. Jude Hospital to deal with some of these payables. And very soon, like we did with Owen King EU Hospital, we are going to help St. Jude Hospital to deal with some immediate payables. So we are taking actions. We have increased the subvention to the St. Jude Hospital, increased the subvention to the Owen King EU Hospital, Millennium Heights Medical Complex, to over 60 something million dollars. So we are taking action. So please, Makadou, Mr. Speaker, tout ce problème là, yoka di en sorte ya. La ni problem toujou. La ni problem pou vwe. Mais nou pa ka fe ko lido opposition e koui, e akwe di mette en ba e le tete nou, akwe di la pa ni problem. Sante ni problem depi, depi, tan, ansien, ansien, ansien. La ni problem pou jwen wi med. La ni problem pou jwen dokter, paske dokter ka ale twabay lot peyi. La ni problem evek pou jwen nos paske se nos la ka ale twabay lot peyi. La ni problem evek bildin. La ni problem evek health center ki ka kwaze. Pou kome kome tan. Health center dewi soa. Ki ko premier minis la ka wepwezante. Li te premier minis avan. I te premier minis pou an ho sik lan e. Ek souwe le ta health center a te. Sa se an nom ki mele evek moun. Sa se an nom ki kadou abot sante. Nou vini nou an GL senta evek jedi. Nou ka yini an ceremony a wonze pou bay health senta an non ef. Ek nou ka kuye yi de Lilia Haraxing Deriso Wellness Centre. Sa pa an nom ki mele abot sante. Sou pa te mele abot health senta an on pa we sou. Plas la ou ka wepwezante ya. Ou ka vin pale abot sante jodi ya. Me wi, nou ni problem. Là, il y a un problème. Avec le gouvernement, il y a un travail, avec le nos, avec le docteur, pour nous tuer, qui nous a résolu ces problèmes-là. Ça, c'est la différence du gouvernement nous, avec le gouvernement yotenien. C'est pour ça. C'est pour ça que je dis. Mais c'est qui a l'idée d'opposition. Mais c'est pas contre cette lycée. Mais c'est pas contre cette lycée. Docteur King qui a là pour tirer Victoria, mettre l'autre côté. A Owen King E Hospital. Yo kite l'hôpital la pou sek lan de yo pa fan yen. Mwen mèm ni l'ide, se paske Dr. King, se an set lisyen. I ale jikan lot kote, menen Keman City, pou privatize l'hôpital la. Mi se pa kote set lisyen. Ek tout bagay mi se ka fache an le. Depou ou leve non set lisi, mi se ka fache. Ou leve non National Trust, mi se ka fache. Ou leve non Sunday Beach, mi se ka fache. Jazz Festival, mi se ka fache. Jik jou ne kwe ol mi se pa kote. Me ga men an chi mi zakwe di, mi se, ou depi jou a ou fet se di se, ou pas sa pa le kwe ol, ou e men jou ne kwe ol? Ha? Eric. Mwen wè ou mi se Taiwan. A Taiwan is Eric. Mi se ka pa le kwe ol pa se sistem ema. Evek lider opposition, pa sa pa le, i pa konet, yon de mo tou se li konet. Yon de mo. Pe an panye, evek, Lot bagay. He connect yon demo. So, Mr. Speaker, what I say to you, what I say to you as I close is this. There are issues which must be resolved, whether it be the National Trust or any national organization. The issue of exemption of VAT is a serious one, and that any organization which gets exemption of VAT is something the government needs to take seriously, 
We want to assist these organizations and I agree that there, can, there will be consultation between, consistent consultation between the government and the St. Lucia National Trust. I support the VAT exemption for the National Trust because I believe the National Trust has an important role to play. I put it to you, Mr. Speaker, lastly, that my view of, of the former Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition is that almost everything he does is against the best interests of St. Lucia and St. Lucians. And he's going to do everything with Martinez and with all of them to destroy St. Lucia. And we are not going to allow that to happen. The people of St. Lucia have seen the benefits that have accrued to them as a result of the policies of this government. And we are going to continue. We are going to continue to fix health care. We are going to continue to fix, fix infrastructure. And we are going to continue with our Prime Minister to ensure that we take St. Lucia to higher, higher heights. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Kashi, Southeast. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I say good afternoon, members. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support this simple resolution in granting the valued, value added tax exemption to the National Trust. But, Mr. Speaker, my contribution is extremely brief, and I want to reference. In fact, I would like to, to Mr. Speaker, speak to the fact that sometimes the Prime Minister, even making his presentation, he doesn't need anybody to defend or protect him. But Mr. Speaker, I listened to the presentation by the Leader of the Opposition. And clearly, the Prime Minister, the member for Castries East and the National Trust was directly attacked with this simple resolution. And that happened when the member the leader of the opposition made reference to the quid pro quo principle as it relates to granting of that, suggesting that there is something of value that the prime minister would receive by granting and asking the question. Mr. Speaker, making that presentation in the way that he did highlighted the fact that certainly the leader of the opposition has problem with the national trust. But the Prime Minister and the member for Castries East, sitting in the cabinet with him, has decided that he's not going to war with persons. He's not going to fight agencies. I'm not a lawyer. And if there's anything of value being given in return by the National Trust, in return to granting VAT, I am sure the member for Viewford South would agree with me, not all gifts are illegal. And that if they decide to work out the, 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 the differences in terms of how they operate the trust, that certainly would be good to grant, a good basis for granting VAT. But instead, the leader of the opposition spoke of the fact that they are not ready. He highlighted that they have two responsibilities, conservation and property management, a commercial activity. Mr. Speaker, that certainly highlighted the fact that the leader of the opposition was grossly wrong to stop the subvention because he highlighted that there were two functions. And if he recognized that there were two functions, he should have at least reduced the subvention, recognizing there's an important function of the National Trust, even when he was in power, as against stopping it completely. Mr. Speaker, the, member of the leader of the opposition highlighted in his presentation the role of professionals. And he spoke of what professionals are saying. He referenced professionals as it relates to health care. He highlighted um, professionals in, in other areas where he spoke. But I listened to the leader of the opposition speak at times. And he takes down pro the very professionals as he referenced at one time. He speaks against them another time, like when he speaks of the Hall of Justice, as if there were no professionals involved. Of course, the National Trust are professionals. And when you are dealing with professionals, you will not always agree with them. I am one that subscribes to conservation. I have an appreciation for securing everything that's of value, that's what we consider that has age, that has seen many days. But Mr. Speaker, it's costly to conserve buildings. Conservation is an expensive undertaking. 
And I understand why the National Trust at this time may ask to exclude VAT from goods and services imported or locally available. Mr. Speaker, if the, the, the National Trust is interested in a professional assessing a building at this time in terms of its structural integrity, in terms of how it can be conserved, it would require monies to do so. And the National Trust is saying that the architects or the engineers who may put VAT on their, on their bill, we are asking you to remove VAT so that we can hire more professionals to assist us in conservation. This is simple. And I see no need to ask the Prime Minister what is the National Trust giving you in return for allowing VAT exemption. But Mr. Speaker, when I project that question down the road, will the leader of the opposition ask to the Prime Minister when the Prime Minister will grant VAT to the medical, for medical equipment, what is he getting in return? When other entities will come to the Prime Minister and ask for VAT exemption and he consider it whether in full or in part, will that same question be asked? Will the leader of the opposition continue to impute improper motives for every transaction that is brought before this house? And I saw this one was a classic example that was way out on the off stump, and certainly when the ball is, when they bowl balls way off, you sometimes allow it to pass. But I certainly could not sit here and listen to a genuine request for VAT exemption for an entity that is so important to our development of our special development and be asked questions that way. Mr. Speaker, I support the work of the National Trust even before I was an elected member. I believe in it, and I believe it was, it was a gross error to have demolished the prisons. And there are a lot of buildings around, around the city of Castries that I personally will be a champion to protect them. Every brick at the, the Pigeon Point is important. And if the National Trust has expressed a concern about the number of persons coming to jazz, it's reasonable to express that. But of course, we will have a conversation with them and resolve it. Because we need to protect what is of value. So we cannot dismiss the National Trust. They are important to us, a very important agent in the development of our place. Mr. Speaker, I've seen so many buildings of value disappear on our landscape, rain on a number of buildings around the city of Castries that I would walk by, I've seen that disappear. Thank God today I can behold the beauty of our central library. And of course, what is left, we need to preserve it. So the VAT allowance that is made to the National Trust is in order. And it is not for the leader of the opposition to get something of value. It is, for, it is an investment in the landscape so that the people of St. Lucia receive value for the role of the, of the National Trust. And Mr. Speaker, finally, I think I will say to the, to, the, to the fact that the Prime Minister has his heart in the right place. Because the question being asked by the leader of the op opposition, or will he ask the National Trust to submit a plan as to how they're going to manage, how they're going to raise revenue, the Prime Minister understands that the primary role of the National Trust is conservation. And therefore, consistent with what I think the, 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 at, on Sunday when, when the member for the member for, 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 for I think the prime, former Prime Minister of St. Vincent spoke to the personality and character of the Prime Minister. I recalled that he referenced Michael. Somebody would love justice and show mercy. So yes. There may be issues with the National Trust, but the Prime Minister used the opportunity when the National Trust approached him to show justice and mercy. 
to not only reinstate the subvention, but to provide VAT removal on goods and services. That is important. And had the former leader of opposition did not starve the National Trust for five years, there probably would not have been a need for such. But the decadence of buildings, and of course, when you take the buildings that need to be maintained, the fact for five years, there's nothing could have been done exponentially more need to be invested in this time. So reinstatement of the subvention certainly is not adequate to maintain or to respond to our conservation responsibility in this country. Of course, the Na National Trust want to be even more proactive. And maybe had there been a subvention, they would have been more proactive in terms of preventing the, the prison from, from going down. Mr. Speaker, when there was a fire many years ago in this prison, I was an employee at the Ministry of Planning, and I had the opportunity at the instruction of a particular minister to go and assess the damage at this prison. And for the first time, I went down and I remember walking through the gallows and I was asking the officers to explain to me the structure of the gallows and how it operates. And I saw architecture and design that, is, that I never ever imagined. Have you ever considered, and I recall Mr. Speaker, the last set of hangings that, that, that happened at this prison, I was a child living in Black Mali. And when the trap doors opened and the noise went through castries, only when I saw the gallows doors, I recognized what made the noise. That is not of value to preserve so that persons could understand what happened in the city of Castries before? That is not a value? So, so when you, you have to be St. Lucian enough to recognize value in our heritage. You need to be St. Lucian more than ordinary to recognize what is important. And I'm saying, that there are some things about us that need to be preserved. And it is that that the, rec that the, the Prime Minister recognized, that reinstating of the subvention is not adequate. But providing that so that exponentially the National Trust can address some of the immediate problems is what is needed. So, of course, Mr. Speaker, I do take my seat, but recognizing that the Prime Minister continues to show justice and mercy as it, as it relates to the development of this country. Member for Chosel, Ultimus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I promise my contribution will be extremely, extremely brief. Um, Mr. Speaker, let me take the opportunity first to, um, before I go into my brief contribution, let me just take the opportunity to, to congratulate um, the Diga Combined School in my community that just won the court's reading competition. Um, I think, Mr. Speaker, um, we need to recognize, you know, that achievement, especially since they, they only Friday gone, they had a, 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 an award ceremony. And I, I didn't see the minister. Well, you, told, you told me that's your favorite place to visit, and I didn't see you there on Friday. Oh, you don't go to church? Yeah. I say, you know, um, and Mr. Speaker, uh, and the theme for that award ceremony was empowering minds to discover, dream, and exceed expectations while achieving holistic excellence. And what a wonderful gift to the school to complement that theme, Mr. Speaker. I also understand that Auger came second and Dame Paulette came third. So 
hats off to the, the winners, but again, congratulations to the Diga School, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I just, you know, I, I, I thought that this was a very simple motion um, to have, um, for us to have dealt with. Um, I think, um, you know, the blame is trying to be put on the leader of the opposition, but we must remember the Prime Minister led, began the race. The Prime Minister began the race, Mr. Speaker. And um, at one point, I thought the, the debate was about um, benefits to the Ministry of Health. Um, and, and I would suggest that, you know, the, the member from Beaufort North maybe, um, you know, address all of the contribution today in a, in a minister's statement that would have been well received, you know, because now I have had all that information that you've given, you know, and, and a document. Member for Suzelle, you have to recall that the member was responding to what was said by the leader of the opposition that healthcare was in a total mess and I that um, the health centers in the Castries Basin were inoperable. The healthcare was, by, I think, so maybe a ministerial statement was not thought of in advance because he didn't think it necessary that he would have had to respond to. Yeah, yeah Mr. Speaker, I hear you, but he just had so much to say, Mr. Speaker, you know, I, 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 I thought. Um, but there was something he, he mentioned um, with regards to some private doctors um, that would be seeking some VAT exemption going forward for some equipment. And, right, I, I, I just want my two, my, my, my two cents on it, and that is, as a government, when we are going to you know, provide such incentives, that there seems to be a correlation where the government could ask for some period um, to, 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 to recognize some patients who cannot afford the high cost and maybe have certain discounts. You know, when, you, you, when the government, when the state helps you, you have a period where you have certain discounts for people who cannot afford. Um, I think it should be a two-way street. Um, just, just something that could be put in as a recommendation when, when, when these um, um, you know, requests come to the attention of the government. Um, to speak. Um, while the, the, the motion seeks to provide incentives, um, um, well, relief of VAT, on the import of local supply of goods and services to the National Trust. Um, generally, I, I support Mr. Speaker, but I would think that it would be a little bit more um, holistic if the Prime Minister and his team could have come up with other entities that could have benefited from that as well. Because we have other non-profit organizations who, who may, on hearing this, would now you know, so maybe we could have come with one list. No, I'm just saying. If they have flight to SSDF. Okay, so um, going forward, you know, well, I'm hoping that they are listening and they could take advantage of this because I know there are endless other entities who, uh, you know, always complaining about the, the, the restrictions because of, of that. And so they could take advantage of coming to cabinet and um, parliament and, and getting um, um, such address. But there's one concern, Mr. Speaker, and I know it was part of the discussion earlier with regards to the canal development. And um, I, 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 I'm hoping maybe the minister at some point can address it. But I was fortunate to pass there not too long ago, and I noticed that there was some, um, I don't want to say destruction in its entirety, but the mangrove. And I think that's something that the National Trust in the past have been very, very vocal about. And I noticed that the mangrove has been, has been partially destroyed and um, as to the effects, long-term effects, how it will affect you know, the, the, the community uh, and the ecosystem. So it is one of the things that you know, I'm hoping with that sort of benefit going to National Trust, a lot more emphasis will be placed on some of these um, areas in St. Lucia where their focus should be. Um, in terms of the preservation of some of our ecosystems and as a member for um, um, Castries South, South, Southeast, Southeast said, you know, other, other, other buildings of interest. So that's my very brief contribution, um, Mr. Speaker, and I thank you.
Minister for Finance. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I just want to to thank the the member for Shozel, Mr. Speaker, for his contribution. Mr. Speaker, I just just two things, Mr. Speaker. Um, the leader of the opposition ran away, but he he spoke about titles that will be stood upon me. Let me inform him of the titles that will be stood upon me. Two degrees from the University of the West Indies. 1997 Parliamentary Representative for Castries East and Minister of Tourism, International Financial Services and Consumer Affairs bestowed upon me by Dr. Kenny Anthony. 2000. 997 to 2001 to 2006, Minister of Commerce, Tourism, Investment and Consumer Affairs, and Parliamentary Representative for Castries East, bestowed upon me by the people of Castries East. 2006 to 2011, Parliamentary Representative for Castries East. 2011 to 2016, Ministry of Infrastructure, Transport, Port Services. 2016-2021, Leader of the Opposition. 2021, and Parliamentary Representative for Castries East. 2021 to now, Parliamentary Representative of Castries East and Prime Minister of St. Lucia. These were the titles bestowed upon me by the people of Saint, people of Castries East, given by the people, and the prime ministership by the majority of elected members. These are the facts. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, I just, if you know, um, they say your friends, your friends, show me your friends, I'll show who you are. There was a guy called Shine Barrow was just kicked out for leader of the opposition in Belize by his party. Another one called Ronnie Yearwood was expelled by his party in Barbados. They were in St. Lucia a few, a few months ago with some people. I don't know if Bradley was there. <laughs> I don't know whether Bradley was around with the speaker. No, he was kicked out yesterday. He was kicked out, he was shined off. <laughs> So you better be careful. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I just wanted to make that point clear, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on, this, on one point, the 2.5% welfare security levy, we've made a point over and over again that we never said it would have gone into, we never said it would have gone into a lockbox. We said it would have gone into the consolidated fund for health and security. Make the point again. The first year, it collected $8 million. This year, it is projected to collect $33 million. Health expenses in this country are in excess of $143 million. Make the point again, Mr. Speaker. The health and security levy goes into the consolidated fund to be used in the consolidated fund and out of there, we spend $143 million for health, Mr. Speaker. That's what it's used for. It is not like the dollar fifty for gas, which when the public of Telusia were told that 150, 150 cents would have put in a lockbox for road construction. I never said that a health and security levy would have been put in a lockbox. I always said it would have been put into the consolidated fund, and that is where it goes. Just want to make it clear, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I will not speak about the OKU or going to health. I just want to thank ministers for the support, Mr. Speaker, and tell you that the, the National Trust continues to play a very important role, Mr. Speaker, because our patrimony is not exactly our checkbook. 
I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, Number 4 order, which amends Schedule 3 of the Act to include as an exempt import or local supply the import or local supply of goods and services by the St. Lucia National Trust. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Finance Minister. We begin? No, we're not. You want to break? Good shot. Yeah, yeah. You want to go, right? You're all right. All right. We hope it's simple. Huh? If, if, well, what's one, one better come? Once here, come back. Before you go. <laughs> Whereas on the section 1091 of the value added tax, Act Cap 15.4 to the Act. It is provided that the Minister of Finance may, by order published in the Gazette, amend the schedules to the Act. And whereas it first, it first provided under Section 102, 1092 of the Act, that an order made pursuant to Section 1091 of the Act is subject to an affirmative resolution of Parliament, except where the amendment is, in, is to commons, is to customs tariffs, headings only. And whereas the Minister of Finance seeks approval of the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, Number 5 order, to amend Schedule 3 of the Act by an affirmative resolution of Parliament to exempt imports of personal items, food, clothing, toys, and other household cons consumables contained in barrels for the period commencing from the 1st of November 2020, 2024 and terminating on the 28th of February 2025. Imports of toys, foods, and care packages by elected parliamentarians for the period commencing from the 1st day of November 2024 and terminating on the 28th day of February 2025. Be it resolved that Parliament by affirmative resolution approves a draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, number 5 order, which amends Schedule 3 of the Act to exempt imports of personal items, food, clothing, toys, and other household consumables contained in barrels for the period commencing from 1st day of November 2024 and terminating on 28th of January of February 2025. Exempt imports of toys, food supplies, and care packages by elected parliamentarians for the period commencing from the 1st of November 2024 and to meet on the 25th day of February 2025. Mr. Speaker, this is just a simple resolution, Mr. Speaker. We know during the Christmas season, parliamentarians and elected representatives, they bring in toys, they bring in toys and gifts and signs and body care items for their constituents, Mr. Speaker. This just allows them to bring it in and we can wave the fact on these items, Mr. Speaker, so that they can be shared among constituents. I don't think there's much to debate on that, Mr. Speaker, and I urge members to support it. Honourable members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, Number 5 order, which amends Schedule 3 of the Act to A, exempt imports of personal items food, clothing, toys, and other household consumables contained in barrels for the period commencing from the first day of November 2024 and terminating on the 28th day of February 2025. B, exempt imports of toys, food supplies, and care packages by elected parliamentarians for the period commencing from the first day of November 2024 and terminating on the 28th day of February, 2025. Finance Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I just want to thank members. I guess all of us are in support, Mr. Speaker. 
Honorable members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, number 5 order, which amends Schedule 3 of the Act to A, exempt imports of personal items, food, clothing, toys, and other household consumables contained in barrels for the period commencing from the first day of November 2024 and terminating on the 28th day of February 2025, B, exempt imports of toys, food supplies, and care packages by elected parliamentarians for the period commencing from the first day of November 2024 and terminating on the 28th day of February 2025. And I'll put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Finance Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following resolution stand in my name. And whereas on the section 1091E of the value added tax cap 15.42, the Act, it is provided that the Minister of Finance may, by order published in the Gazette, amend the schedules to the Act. And whereas it is further provided on the section 1092 of the Act, that an order made pursuant to section 1091 of the Act is subject to an affirmative resolution of Parliament, except where the amendment is to the customs tariff headings only. And whereas the Minister of Finance seeks approval of the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 1 order to amend Schedule 1 of the Act by an affirmative resolution of Parliament to include as zero rated goods a supply of goods under the following customs tariffs fittings, plastic water tanks, water pumps, pressure reducing valves, check non return valves, safety or relief valves, other appliances, parts. We resolve that Parliament by affirmative resolution approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 1 order to amend Schedule 1 of the Act to include as zero rated goods, a supply of goods under the customs tariffs, headings, fittings, plastic water tanks, water pumps, pressure reducing valves, check non return valves, safety or relief valves, other appliances, and parts. Mr. Speaker, this resolution is to exempt items that help, that assist in water storage. For several reasons, Mr. Speaker. You know, um, we have been subject to some severe droughts, Mr. Speaker, and we, we know that during that time, many people suffer from no water. We are encouraging people to harvest water, Mr. Speaker, because these droughts are going to be more persistent hope, because of climate change and because of the fact, Mr. Speaker, that the supply of water because of climate change is reducing all over the world, Mr. Speaker. So we thought that we'd encourage people to make water harvesting part of their way of life. Like the same way you could buy a fridge, you buy a water tank. And we thought it to, it to, to encourage them, we would make the purchase of these tanks and their fittings, we would make it, make it cheaper, Mr. Speaker. Um, only last month, or during this month, the Minister of Agriculture distributed about 1,000 water tanks to the farmers of St. Lucia to, to, water the, 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 to be able to water the crops, Mr. Speaker. And all these fittings for these water tanks, Mr. Speaker, would be vat free. So, Mr. Speaker, again, we also we are trying to encourage people to provide the environment, the enabling environment, Mr. Speaker, so people can get involved in, have, in water harvesting. I also want to advise people, Mr. Speaker, that water harvesting is the way to go. Water harvesting is the way to go. So hopefully, and we hope the private sector joins with us and reduces the prices because any water tank or any fitting that is imported in solution now, when that order becomes effective, even if the price increases out of the country, it ought to cost 12.5% less because there is no VAT on it. 
We hope the private sector passes on that charge because they will, they will not pay the 12 and a half percent VAT, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I urge members to support Mr. Speaker because this, this resolution intends to help us in our water conservation because of the way things are going. And, and even if there's not a job, Mr. Speaker, when there's excessive rain, our water supply gets disru this, is disrupted by excessive rain. So either way, Mr. Speaker, it pays if you get involved in water harvesting, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I urge members to support this resolution. <clears throat> Honorable members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 1 order to amend Schedule 1 of the Act to include as zero rated goods a supply of goods under the following customs tariffs headings 3917.40 fittings, 3925.1010 plastic water tanks, 8413.81 water pumps. 8481.10 pressure reducing valves, 8481.30 check non return valves, 8481.4 safety or relief valves, 8481.80 other appliances, 8481.90 parts. Member for Denry South. Mr. Speaker. I stand in support of this resolution. And Mr. Speaker, I listened to the Prime Minister making this presentation, and it really brought me back to the whole issue of the agricultural sector and the challenge of our farmers in terms of going through sometimes a drought period that requires water to be of tremendous importance to maintaining the crops. And Mr. Speaker, in recent months we've seen the whole issue of drought and how it impacts not only the agricultural sector but St. Lucia as a whole. And Mr. Speaker, we all know without water we are in serious problems. Mr. Speaker, climate change is having a serious negative impact on the agricultural sector. And the Ministry of Agriculture, understanding the challenges and issues that can have with respect to food production, the Ministry in recent months have been distributing hundreds of 1,000 gallon water tanks to our farmers, our livestock farmers, and we are in the process of distributing another 2,000 water tanks to support our crop farmers. Mr. Speaker, the whole issue of food security is very significant, very important to us as a country, and we must continue our efforts to reduce our food import bill. But in doing so, Mr. Speaker, we must continue to provide the support to our farmers to ensure that we continue to rely on what we produce locally, Mr. Speaker, rather than increasing what the imports of what we need locally. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy to see that in addition to the water tanks, our farmers can also benefit from the water pumps, Mr. Speaker. You go throughout the you, you, you travel the agricultural sector and you see farmers who have you know high production very in close proximity to the rivers, but they do not have a simple water tank to irrigate their farms. Now, Mr. Speaker, they have the opportunity to access the water tanks and to also be able to purchase the water pumps that can allow for consistent storage of water, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I believe that I do think that our our populace will take advantage of this opportunity because water storage is the way to go. Mr. Speaker, in recent years, yes, we've seen the whole issue of climate change and how it is affecting us, especially in the forest reserve. 
And every time, soon after heavy rains, you would see the discoloration of the water. So even if you have the rains, Mr. Speaker, we cannot access the river because of the turbidity levels, Mr. Speaker. And as a result, water storage becomes even more important. So I do stand as Minister of Agriculture, Minister for Agriculture, Mr. Speaker, to support this resolution because I think it is very important for the agricultural sector and our food security. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Sozel, Saltivas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, I think it's a very straightforward resolution, and I stand in support of this resolution, Mr. Speaker. But I also want to say a couple of things. Um, um, as the Prime Minister indicated, if, if the intention is to recognize the water shortages that we are experiences, experiencing and, and climate change, Mr. Speaker, I think included in, 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 the, in the list should also be particularly for private developers um, um, uh, uh, and hotels, because all of these things will, will, will reduce the strain on our water supply. It should not just be the plastic water tanks, but it should include maybe the glass-bolted um, tanks, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger um, catchment devices, Mr. Speaker. Um, because at the end of the day, what, what, would get, what we're trying to achieve here is to be able to store water for um, when our, our WASCO system is not able to supply and when, it, when, it, when we, we're going for drought. So I do think um, maybe some consideration should be given. I think people might think of it as a commercial um, aspect, but I, 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 in the scheme of what we're looking at, I'm saying in ch just instead of the plastic water tanks, we can look at the bigger metal um, tanks, the glass bolted, what WASCO brings down, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to achieve is, is, is pretty much water cons conservation. Um, I, I was, uh, the Prime Minister also spoke, and the Minister of Agriculture spoke about the distribution of water tanks. Um, I think farmers have been coming under a lot of pressure with regards to the, the, the lack of water. And I was just telling the M Minister of Agriculture, um, livestock farmers in my community have been complaining of their livestock, particularly the, the, the pigs, um, dying as a result of, of um, lack of water. And so in the distribution, I'm hoping that, you know, um, we'll close our eyes and look at farmers generally um, in, in, in providing these, um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying. And, um, you know, Mr. Speaker, the farmers have been going through. In fact, if you, if you go to the market this week, you'll be paying an arm and a leg for anything because they'll take advantage this week because of the June Equiol. Um, a breadfruit is $20, you know. Um, and, and, and so to give, to give our farmers that sort of relief, Mr. Speaker, I, I do support this resolution and look for the, um, forward to the um, other recommendations as mentioned. Thank you. Member for Denry North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, like my colleagues before me, I stand in support <clears throat> of the resolution presented by the Honorable Prime Minister. And Mr. Speaker, you would permit me to bring a sustainable development um, perspective to the discourse on, on a particular motion. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, the world is facing what is known in environmental circles as the triple planetary crisis, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. And climate change is really responsible for a lot of the environmental problems that we are facing today. And so when the Prime Minister decided to take to the Parliament, Mr. Speaker, a proposal to amend the VAT schedule as it relates to water tanks and, and, and water management generally, I felt obligated to stand and support the motion. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, St. Lucia has sufficient fresh water um, to cause us to get by on a daily basis. Our children have water in the schools, the hospitals have water, and most St. Lucians, if not all, can depend on the water company, Wasco, to provide them with their daily supply to get by. But Mr. Speaker, that will not always be the case. We've seen the disruption that has been caused by climate change. Rainfall patterns are not as predictable as they used to be. And so we have to be proactive. And it is against that backdrop 
the Prime Minister in his wisdom saw the need to provide relief to the average St. Lucian to be in a position where he or she can buy a water tank at a reduced amount. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, there are several hotels under construction in St. Lucia today. There are housing programs that are being expanded, new communities being formed. And all of those developments would put pressure on Wasco and the supply that we have, we have at the John Compton Dam and other um, reservoir, reservoirs across the country. And so it has become very necessary for us to begin to store water. Whether it is water produced by Wasco or rainwater harvested from our roofs, Mr. Speaker. And so I stand, Mr. Speaker, ready to support this particular motion. There are certain parts of the world as we speak today, Mr. Speaker. Some of the most visited waterfalls, some of the best landmarks in Africa and other parts, Mr. Speaker, are being reduced to rubble as we speak. Absolutely no water, bone dry. And the time is fast approaching when St. Lucia and the rest of the Caribbean may very well find themselves as small island developing states in situations, sim situations similar to what I have described. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have to embark on a public um, education campaign where we have to sensitize our population. We have started at the school level, but we have to go beyond the schools, go into the communities and let the adult population in particular know Mr. Speaker, that it has become necessary for us to begin to harvest the waters that we have coming from the roofs of our buildings. Mr. Speaker, at the school level, the majority of schools in St. Lucia would have roofing measuring hundreds or if not thousands of square feet. And you have a downpour, Mr. Speaker, and in the space of, of half an hour, you have hundreds of thousands of gallons of water just gushing off the roofs into the drains and just dis disappear into the waterways. We have to, Mr. Speaker, moving forward to find ways to, to, to harvest that water, have it stored on the school premises so that that water, if not for consumption, can be used to service the toilets, can be used for the general cleaning and upkeep of the schools, and that goes for other public facilities as well. But, this, Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping that with tanks, and other accessories becoming more affordable by way of the adjustment of the VAT, more families will see a need to move in that direction. So from a sustainable development ministry standpoint, Mr. Speaker, I will heartedly support the resolution as presented by the Prime Minister. The other parts of the, of the Caribbean where they are already contemplating desalination equipment, where they, they, they harvest the water from the sea, Mr. Speaker, process it, get the salt out, and make that water suitable for domestic use. We are not yet at that stage. Thankfully, we have sufficient water um, forest cover, Mr. Speaker. We have enough natural sources that we have to jealously guard to ensure that we do not find ourselves in a situation where we rush through desalination sooner than, than we are required to do. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to say that Premier Minister has passed in the Parliament and then uh, uh, Proposal, co if le tie vat en le bay con water tank, e be tank glow. Pour en ekoz, please set le sien pour acheter tank. E pi bagay moun kay bouzen pour fe yo servi glow en dan manye ki pli responsable. Mr. Speaker, kon nou sav, tout kay, tout l'ekol, tout building public en set le sika depan en le wasko. Sa se company glow, gouvernement, pour bay yo glow pour pou bwe, bay yo glow pour sa lave had yo, netoye kay yo pi bay kon sa. Me nou ha we, Development en pays a qu'on nous a parlé que plusieurs go hotel qui a tapé bâti. Et ces hôtels, ça, M. Speaker, ils ont servi à chaiglo. Et ils ont tout qui dépend en les wasco pour bâtir glo. Nous, nous, là, nous sommes une communauté qui a tapé bâti. Qu'on est en anglais, nous avons créé New Settlements. Et tout ce qui est ça, sans qui qui a fait, comme plusieurs qui est ça, c'est ça qui a besoin de glo. Hors wasco, comme on sait bien. Moun sa lave bagay sal, et puis fe moun sa, sa, sa bay um, fle yo glo pi bagay kon. Et nou ka di, Mr. Speaker, glo a nou ni an pakay toujou ni ase, because nou ka, nou ka vive dan tan ko la ni an bay ou ka kwe climate change. Et la ni le an la ni ako ou ka, ou ka expect an chay la pli, et ko jou ka jwenn la pli, se soleil ou ka jwenn. Et la ni le ko ki ka ni soleil, kon adan dezot, 
very recently in the Sahara Desert and, and some of the other um, deserted um, parts of the world, they are experiencing rainfall like they've never done before. So there has been some disruption to the climate and we can no longer predict rainfall and it is very possible that the time is not far away when St. Lucia will go for extended periods, much more than what we've experienced in the past without rainfall. And it becomes even more critical and necessary now to have the infrastructure, at least at the level of the home, to cause people to save water um, so that there'll be less of a disruption in terms of their daily chores and how they go about living their lives. And so, Mr. Speaker, with this very brief intervention, I support the resolution as presented by the Honorable Prime Minister. Member for Denry North, I, it has been brought to my attention that you're celebrating a milestone being a member of this house. Mr. Speaker, since you have engaged me, I have no choice but to yield to the, the presiding officer and place on the record that, yes, on the 24th of September 2024, I went past the Honorable Ferdinand Henry to become the longest serving elected parliamentarian in the constituency of Denry North post independence. And may I add, Mr. Finance Minister, that on our recent trip to Taiwan, we were shown an invention by the Taiwanese that makes water out of air. Nothing more, it just sucks in the air and the water comes out. We drank the water, it was absolutely just like our water. So we may want to, you may want to engage Mr. Prime Minister, the Taiwan's ambassador. Um, no out of air, no, the only attachment to the machine was to the electrical outlet. And it just sucks in air and out comes water. Member for Castries North. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity this afternoon to probably support this resolution, motion rather, which seeks to grant waivers on, of the value added tax on water tanks, fittings, pressure reducing valves, and other items necessary for water production, water harvesting, etc. Mr. Speaker, I speak from a public utilities standpoint, and the fact that um, the minister responsible for public utilities under which water falls, as we speak, there are challenges within the water sector. Challenges in as far as our ability with the current infrastructure of water to be able not just to harness and to reserve, but our ability to maintain our own capacity of water in the country at a national level. During the period 2016 to 2021, the then government undertook as a project which was left behind by the previous government of the Labour Party to undertake the program or the initiative of dredging the John Compton Dam. Some $60 million, Mr. Speaker, was allocated and was, of course, accessed by the water company to commence the program of dredging the John Compton Dam. $60 million, million Mr. Speaker. The capacity of the John Compton Dam when it was built was to a capacity of just over 600 million gallons of water. Water that would have been able to facilitate and to provide to the people of this country for a long time, particularly in the north of the island. At that time when the John Compton Dam was built, then called the Roseau Dam, the intention was to have this northern facility provide water for the north of the island and then in the south to explore the potential of harnessing water out of the Grace Woodlands area for the south of the country, along with other initiatives that were in the making. In the initiative to dredge the Rosodam, Mr. Speaker, 
after three to four years of that project, only 8% of the dam was, was dredged. Only 8%, having spent $60 million, Mr. Speaker, engaged in an activity that was designed to move away from the original intention, move away from the scientific um, intention, and to do based on the whims and fancies of others in an endeavor and a claim of dredging, only 8%. It means, Mr. Speaker, that the people of this country are left now to fend for themselves, fend for themselves to be able to put reserve at home in their community so as in any event, as we see now, the shortages which are happening, the many cutoffs that we're having where you have Wasco having the need to shut down the system to allow them to be able to do repairs. And therefore, people now have got to think of how do I facilitate the collection of water and reserving of water and harnessing of water so as to be able to survive at any given time when Wasco shuts off the system. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, in an endeavor to improve the water system in this country, WASCO will need well over $250 million to undertake that exercise. The first part of it, Mr. Speaker, is to deal with the raw water line, which really and truly at this time should be the time to deal with it, because by now we would have finished the Roseau Dam, the, the, the John Compton Dam, and as far as the dredging is concerned, we would have improved our capacity, at least if we had improved the capacity from what it is now, from 200 million gallons to probably about four or 500 million gallons, the, gallons then we can move to the, the war, raw water line. The cost, Mr. Speaker, of, and, and I speak of the investment in the raw water line, from Vana to Cul-de-Sac is estimated at 27 million US dollars. That's the kind of investment we are called upon to do as a consequence of neglect. Then we've got the Thebels treatment plant in Cicero, which is 50% operational. And that is another sum that we are now estimating in terms of refurbishing that plant and to bring it to maximum capacity. But even after we have brought it to maximum capacity, and even if the raw water line is improved to its full capacity, then we've got to deal with the water pipeline infrastructure throughout the country because there is a need to replace them. For many of you who move around in the north of the island, particularly in the city of Castries, many occasions our investment in road infrastructure is interfered by the fact that the deteriorating infrastructure of pipelines are busting every day, particularly when we build roads. Because once you build the roads and those pipelines are beneath the ground without having been replaced, then the vibration and compaction of equipment certainly deals with the mutilated and the decaying infrastructure beneath there. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, we are currently on the Chaussee Road with one of the initiatives for Infrastructure 24, and that is to, replay, to pave and reconstruct the Chaussee Road as one of the streets within the city of Castries, first one to be done. The decision was taken. Because those lines are busting so often, we must put in new pipelines. And so what is happening now, Mr. Speaker, is that we've given Wasco the opportunity to proceed and to put in those, in, uh, those pipelines. And presently today, in fact, some parts of the Chaussee Road has been closed to facilitate the construction on, and the excavation, excavation that is to take place to put in those pipelines. But the pipeline alone, Mr. Speaker, it took us six months to get the pipeline. The cost. $2.6 million Beg your pardon? To, to, to establish the new pipelines. Six 
the entire project is over six million dollars, say seven million dollars, to do that road, which includes the cost of the pipeline. But I've said all of this, Mr. Speaker, to give you an understanding of the inheritance of this administration, the inheritance of neglect, the inheritance of irresponsibility. So just imagine, Mr. Speaker, a gentleman decides that he will order vaccines valued at $7 million, no guarantees provided, nothing at all, no due diligence provided. That $7 million could have done Chaussee Road. That $7 million, Mr. Speaker, could have done Chaussee Road. And we are still without the vaccines, and I'm not too sure if we have recovered the $7 million. But that is the kind of neglect that we have inherited, the neglect of our infrastructure, the neglect of our schools, of our health services. You heard the Minister for Health, Mr. Speaker, earlier. I mean, this is a crying shame of any government who claims to be respon responsible. And so, Mr. Speaker, in many ways, small and big ways, this administration has demonstrated compassion. This administration has demonstrated understanding of the needs of the people. This, this administration, Mr. Speaker, has shown that it cares about the people. And what are we doing today? One may say, what is the big deal about waving VAT on water tanks? What is the big deal? My only concern about the deal is that the, the, um, the businesses, the businesses who are selling ensure that that is removed and that the customer benefits the initiative being provided here. So here we're saying fittings to make plumbing cheaper. Plastic tanks to give customers an opportunity to get plastic tanks, water tanks, at a reduced rate. Water pumps, which, is, which are a necessity for persons wanting to establish water tanks, and when there's no water, to be able to ensure that they can pump and get the right pressure. Pressure reducing valves to ensure that when the pressure comes from Wasco, that those valves can reduce the pressure at an acceptable um, level for consumption. Check valves to ensure that there are no returns of water running your meter and draining your system into the, main, into the main grid. Safety and relief valves and other appliances and parts for the water system. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is an initiative that must be undertaken and it's an initiative that must be embraced by all. Because it's, a, it's one thing if your electricity goes out and then you can have a, a torchlight or a candle, or a lamp, once you're ready. But it's one thing when water goes out, and you have no water. And you have to go searching for water. So the thing is, to be able to get everyone to develop a new culture of having water reserve within their home environment. In my case, I remember, Mr. Speaker, once I experienced one drought season, no water. And I invested in water tanks to the extent that um, water tanks are all over, that I can never run out of water at any given time. That is the thing. But Mr. Speaker, we are saying, we are saying, give every individual an opportunity. And the government has started. We heard what the Ministry of Agriculture is doing, providing farmers with water tanks so that they, can, they are able to ensure that they, 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 they can get the farmers to water the, the plants and vegetables and to keep them healthy and productive at any given time. In other circles, in other departments, we have done that. In my constituency, we are about launching a, a similar program to assist persons. But Mr. Speaker, the most important thing I always believe is not just to say give water tanks to harness water from the main grid, from the, 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 the Wasco lines, but also to be able to harness the rainwater. I believe that we now need to tell people, listen, when you build your homes, design a water system that will allow you to harness the water sufficiently to reduce the, number, the, the amount of runoff that may take place into your streams and ravines. So all of that water in a properly designed system connect, connected together 
people into your underground water tank or into your tank below the surface of your home or the, or, or the pipeline so that at any given time you can get that water to use. And that's where the pumps come in because in many instances water will not be able to get up to the, your shower if, it has a, if, if the tanks are the same level with your floor. In some countries, Mr. Speaker, and I know for sure Bermuda, Bermuda, the Development Control Authority will not approve any plan, any housing plan whatsoever, unless you have a water, a water harnessing system designed into the house. And it must be, it, it must be implemented. It is not one that you say, yes, I'm, here's my design, and you, you show it, but you don't do it. You must do it, because the inspectors will come, and if you do not implement it, your, your project is stopped. The time has come for us to do that sort of thing here, to ensure that every home that is designed, every building that is designed, demonstrates that there is a system that will harness that water off the roof into a system that can be, that can be used at any, any given time. The same thing, Mr. Speaker, and I've been speaking to the people at planning and DCA, that we also need to look at a requirement for construction of homes and other businesses to ensure that every building, every building is designed with an off-street parking facility, a garage or something. It doesn't matter where you're up a hill or down a hill at the bottom on the flat, but designed with something. The only caveat to that, Mr. Speaker, we understand that when people who do not have the financial means may not be able to build a house and then provide the necessary parking facility. Because if you're building on a hillside, a slope, based on the gradient, that might be a steep one, and then you've got to spend extra money in putting up columns and then building that car port. But you can say, listen, build your house, later on, you'll put, up, you'll put your car port and give them ideas out as to how to do it and how to utilize the space above and below the, that car port that they're building. These are some of the things we must do. It has to be, Mr. Speaker, a level of sensitization of our people, of some of the essential needs that we need for our daily living. What do we need? Food, clothing, and shelter, basic. But the other services that we need to put in place. We are getting to a point, Mr. Speaker, where with renewable energy, Many people understand the importance of having their own solar systems to be able, the photovoltaic systems, to be able to generate their own electricity. Soon we'll be coming to the Parliament, Mr. Speaker, and we'll be presenting a new Electricity Supplies Act, which will then open up the market for electricity production, energy production, so that while the main energy operator in St. Lucia, who enjoys a monopoly at this time, will continue to be able to generate electricity from fossil fuels. People, independent power producers, and others will be able to participate into the system to generate electricity for their own use, but also to be able to sell back into the grid and to be compensated for what they have sold to the grid, the excess. So these are some of the things that we as a government believe that we must at least enshrine in the people, in the psyche, at least to get them sensitized to the needs. And so in this initiative, Mr. Speaker, here this afternoon, as a consequence of this resolution, the initiative to waive value-added tax on all of those related items to do with water harvesting and storage and, 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 and transmission and pumping and all of this sort of thing is indeed a bold initiative on the part of the government, and I stand here and support this initiative this afternoon. I thank you. Finance Minister. Thank members for the support, Mr. Speaker, and I hope that the public of St. Lucia take advantage of that's basically what's an incentive. Honourable members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 1 order to amend Schedule 1 of the Act 
to include as zero rated goods a supply of goods under the following customs tariff headings. 3917.4 fittings, 3925.1010 plastic water tanks, 8413.81 water pumps, 8481.10 pressure reducing valves, 8481.30 check non-return valves, 8481.40 safety or relief valves, 8481.80 other appliances, 8481.90 parts. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Finance Minister. Yes, Bills. This week I I beg to present for first reading a bill shortly entitled Money Laundering Prevention Amendment. Money Laundering Prevention Amendment. This week, I beg to move for the suspension of standing order 48.2 to allow this bill to go through the remaining stages at the sitting. Honorable members, the question is that standing order 48.2 be suspended in order to allow the finance minister to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put the question as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Leave is granted. Please proceed, Minister for Finance. Mr. Speaker, the Money Laundering Procurement Act, number 13, 1220, the Act, has been identified in St. Lucia's forefront mutual evaluation as being deficient for the purposes of complying with the Financial Action Task Force recommendations. More specifically, the Financial Action Task Force Recommendation 26 with respect to regulation and supervision of financial institutions. Uh, Minister of Finance, I don't want to interrupt you, but I need to remind members who may not have gotten the money laundering amendment in the package over the weekend. That is because it was circulated in September. So every member ought to have a, a copy from the last meeting in September. Sorry, Prime Minister, you can proceed. The Financial Intelligence Authority, the authority, has therefore proposed various amendments to the Act for compliance. The bill contains various amendments, including an amendment to broaden the scope of the definition for beneficial owner, so that the beneficial owner also includes an individual or natural person on whose behalf a transactional activity is being conducted. The list of persons with whom the authority can disseminate information is also expected to include the special prosecutor and the chief executive officer or the citizenship by investment unit. The bill also makes it mandatory for, for a financial institution or person engaged in other business activity to establish the true identity of the other person on whose behalf or for whose benefit a person may be acting in a proposed transaction and not simply to demonstrate that it has taken reasonable steps to establish the customer's liability, identity. The authority must approve the appointment of a compliance officer at the management level with a financial institution. However, in the case of a licensed financial institution, the central bank is required to consult with the authority for approval of the appointment of a compliance officer. The bill makes it clear that a financial institution or person engaged in other business activity may decide to conduct customer due diligence even after having previously conducted a customer due diligence, obtaining adequate data about a customer. In conducting a customer due diligence, a financial institution may require a person to complete a source of funds declaration. At present, the value of a transaction is specified at 10,000 United States dollars. However, the bill seeks to change the value of a transaction to 27,000 Eastern Caribbean dollars, which is the equivalent exchange at 270. In addition, the bill includes an offense 
provision where a person fails to declare his or her source of funds. The fraud takes that offense provision was inadvertently removed from the act was amend when the act was amended in 2021. The introduced a new provision to, pro to prohibit a person from using or having possession of property while knowing that that property, whether in whole or in part, directly or directly, represents his or her proceeds of criminal conduct. With these legislative amendments, Senator hopes to improve its technical compliance we are waiting at the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force plenary and working group meeting that is scheduled to take place in November 2024. Mr. Speaker, as this bill, as I just said, Mr. Speaker, it's an amendment to the Money Laundering Prevention Act, Mr. Speaker, to make it more in line with after an evaluation was done in St. Lucia's fourth round mutual evaluation report, Mr. Speaker. See, Mr. Speaker, we are part of a broader financial world. And St. Lucia must meet these requirements, Mr. Speaker. And part of these requirements means that any time you go to the bank with U.S. dollars, in that case, more than 10,000 U.S. dollars, you must have a source of funds, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, sometimes our citizens complain that even if the amount is less than 10,000 US dollars, they are still as a source of funds. So, Mr. Speaker, we hope that the, in the, in, in the financial institutions follow the law, Mr. Speaker, but um, clients are not brought to a point which is near harassment, Mr. Speaker. We hope good sense prevails. But these laws have to be followed because this is not a bank that's making these laws or the government that's forcing these laws upon the people, Mr. Speaker. If we want to be part of the international financial, situation, financial institutions or the financial world, we have to follow these laws. So, Mr. Speaker, even we politicians, we are the ones who suffer the most because we are called PEPs politically exposed persons, Mr. Speaker, and your whole, your every part, and I'm sure the Minister, the Parliamentary Chair is, is suffers from that, from being a pep, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and sad, he's right. Your family also, Mr. Speaker. I mean, he's right. You, your family, I mean, it really is, it's got to a point, Mr. Speaker, where as soon as you become a, a politician, you're classified as a pep, and then the rest is history. But Mr. Speaker, there is still some hope for us because the, just recently the courts in the UK passed a law saying that some of these laws against us are discriminatory. And I hope that the powers that are listening in St. In Lucia, the AG, <laughs> understand that, Mr. Speaker. And when our, our officials go to debate and discuss these things, Mr. Speaker, with people who in their own countries, that law is not so, so, so strident. In our own countries, that law is not so strident. It's like, it's like opening a bank account. Although now I understand it's a little easier to open a bank account, Mr. Speaker. You can walk into a, 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 any bank in New York and, or Miami and open a bank account. But in our island, but that's what you have to do when you are a small island. You have to pay for these things. We want to comply, but we're asking our local, of, our local officials to be a little less, to understand that the limit is $27,000, and unless you have reason to be, to be real suspicious, do not put clients for what they put them. Taxi drivers, vendors, Mr. Speaker, go through this. this, this, this this has to be the speaker. People get remittances from abroad in, 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 from, in, um, from the relatives in the US, Mr. Speaker. They have to go through that, that, that hassle. And we're asking, we asking the compliance officers to be a little, you could, you could know the history of a client, Mr. Speaker. Because everybody in St. Lucia, we have a small country. Everybody knows who is who. But, so, but the regular citizen, the regular vendor, 
who is hustling Mr. Speaker. Don't put them through that kind of, of, of stress for two, three thousand dollars which they might collect from the cruise ships. From the cruise ship passenger, Mr. Speaker. So I urge members to support it. We have to do it. We have to comply. Because if we have to remain in the international financial world, we have to follow the rules. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, the question is that the money laundering prevention amendment bill be read a second time. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, as many as of a country opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. An act to amend the Money Laundering Prevention Act, Cap 12.20. Clause 2. Interpretation. Clause 2 stands part of the bill. Clause 3. Amendment of Section 2. Clause 3 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 4. Amendment of Section 5. Clause, four st clause 5 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 6. Speaker, Clause 5 now. You made an error. Oh, sorry. Clause 5. Amendment of Section 15. Clause 5 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 6. Amendment of Section 16. Clause 6 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 7. Amendment of Section 17. Minister for Finance? No, next clause. Aye. Uh oh. So, clause. <laughs> Clause 7 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 8. Substitution of Section 21. The speaker, Finance Minister. Yes. The Speaker, Clause 20, um, 21A and B. Um, replace 25 with 27,000, which is the equivalent of 10,000 US dollars, which is what the Census Act calls for. So it's of 20, so 20, 10,000 by the exchange rate of 270 is 27,000. 27. So with both in on, A and B. Yeah. On page 7, Senior Minister, Yes. section 21, source of funds, mm -hmm. 1A and 1B. Instead of 25,000, make it 27, using a rate of 2.7. Clause 8, as amended, stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 9. Amendment of Section 30. Attorney General, um, in, in parenthesis, unless there is a comma after the word not in the first line, it does not make sense. A comma between the word not and knowing. Absent of that comma, it reads badly and it doesn't make sense. A person shall not. A person shall not. Knowing that any property, you know, the comma has to go there. Yeah. Very. <laughs> Clause 9, as amended, stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 1. Short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. <laughs> On the members, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The eyes have it.
Honorable members, I beg to report that the money laundering bill went through committee stages with amendments to clauses eight and nine. Finance Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the report of the committee be adopted and the bill be read a third time and passed. Honorable members, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the money laundering prevention amendment bill be read a third time and passed. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Be it enacted by the King's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This act may be cited as the Money Laundering Prevention Amendment Act 2024. Speaker, I beg to present for first reading a bill shortly entitled Criminal Code. Criminal Code Amendment. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be presented for the, for the second reading at the next or subsequent sitting of this Honorable House. Finance Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the first reading of a bill shortly entitled Supreme Court Amendment. Supreme Court Amendment. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be presented for second reading at the next or subsequent sitting of this Honorable House. Before I call on the Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, so, could I? Yes. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank all the gens here. I would like to thank all the gens here, the Parliament. Un bon journée créole, mais même les gens ont bon temps parce que créole c'est à bord de nous et même bien content, mais ça parle en langue maman moi. Tout le temps, c'est ici, on aura mes camarades, mais on aura Bradley Felix, mais veuillez souhaiter un bon journée créole. Tout le monde, il y a un bon journée créole pour tout le monde. C'est ici. Merci, 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 Mr. Premier Minister. Um, before I call on the Deputy Prime Minister, I did mention about the flag, but I omitted to say it was the idea of the clerk and the Deputy Clerk. Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I move that this House stands <laughs> adjourned. Sign it out. <laughs> Honourable members, the question is that, is that this house do stand adjourned sine die. <laughs> and now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a country opinion say no, the eyes have it, the eyes have it, sitting adjourned. We've come to the conclusion of today's sitting of Parliament where there will three motions down and um, several papers that were laid uh, when the house when the house when the house opened this morning uh, there was the first statement by the minister of of tourism investment creative industries culture and information he read a statement around the citizenship by investment program and what the minister uh, sought to do was to give a status report on the citizenship by investment program he basically was allaying any um at any fears that the solutions public would have concerning the cip he said that the cip was really sound and it was in good hands he he spoke on the tremendous economic benefits that the cip has provided for um, this country he spoke on the various um, projects that CIP had funded 
in nearly all of the sectors like agriculture, tourism, farming, um, security support, educational support, health support, etc. He said that there was a surplus of uh, $22 million that had gone into the into the economic fund but a total of 146.8 million dollars overall which had gone into the um, economic fund through cip he spoke on the various projects as i mentioned earlier um, the various projects as i mentioned earlier that the cip was funding he spoke on the infrastructural project etc um, the minister also went into some detail concerning a situation um, with one of the investors, I think it was BMX, and he spoke of some challenges which that investor had faced um, in his home country when he was arrested. The, prime, the minister said that the government um, is, being, is still investigating even though they have received initial assurances uh, um, from the investor himself that um, all of this was was really about um, political intimidation if you like and that um, he the investor had already uh, transferred all of his shares to um, another investor so all in all this was a really important statement in light of everything that's been said and all the allegations concerning citizenship by investment program the minister had sought to give a detailed position one more thing i wish to add concerning this as we go on and speak about the rest of what happened here today but one one thing which was um, of critical importance which the minister highlighted was that he said the processes for verification of applications and approval of applications for citizens citizenship by investment he said all the processes that due robust process the robust due processes in place what exists now he said was really adopted from the previous administration he said all of the processes okay dealing with um, um, dealing with any request for citizenship by investment program was actually um, inherited if you will and maintained um, by um, inherited from the previous government and this is what his government is is going by to you know verify um, applications etc he also said there's only one difference and that is the escrow account which initially the previous government had stated or had was part of the whole process was to be outside of this country he said that now they have placed it inside of country so in effect strengthening the processes um, for who could apply for citizenship by investment program and how one is granted and approved um, to, to, to receive any citizenship um, of St. Lucia through the investment we um, merci Virgil. Uh a plus sa assistant premier ministre, le ministre qui est responsable de faire investissement avec le tourisme, avec aussi si à qui a répondu. Et un autre bail dit qui était important pour ajouter à ce Saoudi, c'est que la dernière parole, ce qui est compris, c'est le gouvernement de 14 000 passeports. Um, and for the who have an investment, and the idea is that the pièce is approaching 200, I don't know if it's a number exactly, but it's approaching 2,000, 2,873 was approved. It was approved, but it's not going to be able to use it, but it's not going to be able to use it. Also, I don't know if it's a doctor, Trust. Aussi, 
avec avec mon chef face à l'opposition par des assauts là aussi et lui on aura Bruton Frédéric par des assauts on aura Mozi Jean Baptiste par des assauts avec on aura Joaquin Henry et tous les cadres ça on parle des assauts motion ça là avec quand même il était passé mais aussi nous tirer en l'autre motion donc tirer vague à ce comme nous habité pour tirer vague à ce manger à ce habitat avec un avec trois espoirs dans ma vie commencer premier novembre pour être ça va durer jusqu'au 8 à 28 février l'année prochaine la motion ça a été passé aussi et quand deuxième motion c'est de vous tirer vague à ce un bagage qui a servi pour, pour stocker de l'eau parce qu'il nous sortit un bar quand même qui était très 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 difficile et avec un chai à monter souffert par ça avec le gouvernement d'accord il n'y a qu'à encourager plus le monde pour, 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 pour conserver de l'eau avec un par la pluie et avec tout le comme ça alors le gouvernement qui est à être vague à ce c'est bagaille là qui moun ka servi pour 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 faire plomber pour moun bagaille nous ka c'est tant tant en plastique là c'est différents pressing dans bagaille pressure valve toutes ces bagailles comme ça qui ka aider moun sauver sauver et bien stocker de l'eau et à à ce motion cela nous devait on va faire fait prospère même pas la main pour sud de nuit on va chaud et droit qui même pas la main pour nord de nuit avec on va Stevenson King God à Nord de Cassie qui parlait à ce monsieur Sala. On l'a pour finir Genève, il a tenu un bill en loi, le gouvernement passé, comme normal pour ça, il a tenu mon élongé, pour empêcher le monde de servir l'argent, qui m'a dit que mon élongé, empêcher l'argent qui n'est pas légal, passer en pays. Avec ces conseils, en cas qu'on s'est passé aujourd'hui, la tenue de l'autre, en ville qui était pour passer, mais ils ont mis des pour, ils ont envoyé pour l'autre fois, en cas qu'on s'est passé. Well, that's it. And you, you did mention the Sinusha National Trust. Oui, oui. Yes. And um, so there we have it. Michael gave you the complete roundup of the the motions and the bills that were read and the motions that were passed. Uh, we meet here again on Thursday, where we'll the the upper house. Oh, next week, Michael is just correcting me. Next week, where the upper house will debate those those motions and those bills. So, thank you once again for joining us. On behalf of uh, my colleagues, I'm Virgil Leonti. Michael Gasler, merci un peu. Et quand nous avions un voyou au station télévision, NTN pour plus sa capacité à ce gouvernement.